we're going to get started, guys. So if you want to mute, I will uh, get things rolling here and we'll get started. So, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, appreciate those on the call who uh, returned from our morning sessions. For anybody that's new and just joining us this afternoon, my name is Randy Fulmer. I am the uh, the chairman of the uh, Underwriting and Loss Prevention Committee with PAMIC. Uh, I work at Donegal Insurance Group, and we're very happy to have everybody on today. As I said this morning, our first annual and hopefully last annual virtual meeting that uh, we'll get through all these things, and eventually we will be uh, back to normal with this being a face-to-face -face meeting in 2021. We had some great sessions this morning. And I look for some uh, great interaction and some really good information for everyone on the, on the uh, session this afternoon. We're gonna kick it off with a, a discussion um, on what drives hard and soft underwriting cycles. And we're pleased to have with us today, Kevin Finn. Kevin is the president and CEO of Mutual Capital Analytics. Um, has over 20 years of executive experience in the PNC industry. He spent the last 14 years with Hartford Financial Group. For five years, he led the small commercial product management team responsible for delivering top and bottom line growth. During that time, premiums grew from 3.2 billion to 3.7 billion, uh, while the combined ratio decreased from 91 to 88. Through this combination of premium growth and margin improvement, underwriting earnings increased over 30% during his tenure. Before joining the small commercial leadership team, Kevin led national accounts, specialty programs, and captives for nine years. Kevin transformed these businesses from capabilities in the specialty businesses to meaningful con contributors to earnings for the entire organization. Kevin be began his career with Liberty Mutual in Boston in their actuarial program, achieving his fellow of the Casualty Actuarial Society in 2002. In addition to his actuarial positions, he also held leadership positions with national accounts underwriting, and mergers and acquisitions. He resides in Farmington, Connecticut with his wife and two children. He's had a great passion for volunteering in his community with a special focus on youth sports as he sits on the board of directors for both the baseball and basketball youth leagues. In addition, Kevin volunteers his time with the services for the elderly. It's our pleasure to have Kevin with us today. And Kevin, thank you for joining us and we look forward to your message. Thanks, Randy, and uh, thanks for everyone joining us this afternoon. Apologize for that lengthy introduction. I should have been shorter and sweet, but um, you know, really, really excited about this opportunity uh, and jumped at it when the, the committee was was interested in talking about the, the hard and the soft underwriting cycles. What drives it? It's such a, a unique phenomenon within the insurance space, and so understanding what's driving it, also looking at the patterns, but then most importantly, what I what I find the most interesting in having the opportunity to lead some other businesses along the way was then figuring out a way how to how to take advantage of that. And as we go through today, we'll, we'll end the session with, with really a view of my, you know, some, some takeaways in terms of how the mutuals, how the underwriters, loss control leaders here can, uh, can take advantage of that. Let me, uh, let's get started here. And so I think there should be a, a poll that will be coming up shortly from, uh, from PAMIC. Um, but really what we're going to touch on is just the, the history, kind of what's happened. Why does this consistently happen? What do competitors do? during the hard, like how does that change? You know, what's the current state of the market? You know, looking at some of the results and some of the rate changes that have, uh, that have really accelerated over the last 12 to 18 months, what, what causes that? It's a phenomenon that, conti that continues to happen, but why? And then really, we'll, like I mentioned, we'll end up with, uh, with strategies to think about how do you, you can't, the, these cycles are going to continue but how do you manage them? How do you most effectively position your company to, uh, to continue to be successful? So, um, Brittany, I don't know if we, did we get any of the, did we get some feedback in terms of the, uh, the, the experience level of folks? All right, so it looks like a very experienced. So if we look here, right, some folks less than 12 months, you know, one to three, um, and then really, you know, very, very experienced group. And so some of these, some of you have been here in, in the industry for a while, this is gonna be, you've experienced these. You've experienced these market cycles, the highs and the lows. Uh, for those who are uh, who are newer to the industry, you know, I, I thought about you know Paul and Bryce this morning, 
right? What does it feel like to join into an industry in the, in the midst of a, a hard market? You see, I love this visual of, you know, someone on a roller coaster. Uh, it's scary. It's exciting. It's enthralling. I mean, there's so many, there's so much going on during the, the heart of a hard market. Uh, you feel really empowered as an underwriter. Like you're in control of, of a lot of the uh, the activity. And so, you know, it's it's all these emotions come through. But, but definitely thought about uh, Paul and Bryce this morning as, as they uh, great talent that, that starts joining the, uh, the industry. But let's go into, let's look at a little bit of history. And so here, what you see, this is the last 20 years of the PNC industry. So this is the entirety of the industry. And what you see here, these are the combined ratios. So how much underwriting income is being generated by the, the PNC industry. And what you just see, you just see this, this, roller, this roller coaster, right? From the highs in 2001, 116% combined ratio. So losing 16 cents on every dollar. Down to 2006, five years later, it drops down to 93, right? Five years later, I'll just use those as intervals. Back in, two, in 2011, it jumps to 107. 16 drops to 101. Maybe we could forecast to 2021. 20, we'll, we'll see what's going to happen there. But you just see this very regular pattern of activity and results that the industry uh, that continues to, to produce. Right? I think that one of the interesting um, industry conversations going on right now is like, will these cycles continue? With the advancements in data and analytics, the ability to have great insight into your portfolio, will that continue? I'd say, you know, as, as we look at market activity now, uh, this cycle is absolutely continuing. If there is no end in sight, uh, we'll go through some of the numbers, but you know, there, there's greater capabilities, but, but the cycle seems to be uh, alive and, and, and well. And so one of the other things I think that's really interesting is when you take a look at the, the insurance industry versus all others, like why does this, why does this, it does happen in insurance, but does it happen in other industries? So what you'll see here, the, 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 the graph will show the orange line is the return on equity over the last 35 years for the Fortune 500. So using that as a proxy is kind of all other industries. And then the blue line is PNC. So you see really here, you know, it's, the, the, it's, it's a relatively tight band around the Fortune 500. Right? There's not a lot of volatility in those numbers and the average is higher. So the average return on equity for these companies in the Fortune 500 is around 13.2 and less volatile. Whereas in the PNC, and this is in aggregate, you look at it at about 9%, with more swings up and down. So you do definitely see that this is a, a challenge that is, uh, that is unique to the insurance industry. And so before we get into kind of the current state, I think it's, it's uh, always interesting to just put some definitions around what are we talking about when we say hard and soft market. And so, you know, this, there's, this isn't a Webster definition, but when you think about it, you've got, so the, the soft market tends to be correlated with strong profits. So when the industry is doing well, and this is the industry as well as this phenomenon happens at a line of business as well. So strong profits, that's usually when folks would categorize that as a soft market. On the bottom left-hand side, what you see is the, the other end of the spectrum. This is the hard market. This is when results are above, so, so carriers that are losing money on the underwriting side. So I think about the results in 2001 and 2016 where carriers were no longer making money on the underwriting side, that is when you see a hard market. Rates start to change, you know, carriers start to, to tighten up in terms of what they're willing to, uh, to write, and that's the hard market. There is, I guess, probably less talked about are, a little, are the, the transition periods. You've got the, uh, if you start in the soft market in the top right and then go down to the bottom right, you'll see the margin start shrinking. So profitability gets closer to 100, right? They'd say, you know, this is, this is where the market's firming. On the other end, once you get after, once you go through the hard market, and there's usually large, quick corrections, right? That's when you start to feel the softening of the market, the top left part. Carriers have reacted to to the results, and they start to, you know, make pretty aggressive adjustments, and then you get back into this cycle. And you could, you really look at this by the industry. You also look at it by line of business. You know, this phenomenon continues to uh, to happen and hold true. Uh, there's, you know higher and lower troughs, but, but it is a relatively consistent pattern by which uh, we, you see the results for the industry. One of the things that's always interesting, I'll ask the, the group for some participation here based on a lot of the experience that's in the group, you start to see different activities, right? How do competitors really behave? But what you'll see is if, again, this is more on the, the publicly traded stock side, 
what you see is when strong profits, these are paraphrasing the uh, CEOs, but you know, very much we'll talk about, you know, we're, we're maintaining our underwriting discipline on new business. But yeah, we're, we're making a lot of money, but we're gonna be very, very disciplined. Then you listen a quarter, two, three, four later, this margin starts shrinking and, and it's invariably about we're us using our rich data and analytics to have a disciplined approach to rate and retention. We're not charging everyone the same rate change. We have a very segmented view. And you just hear this in, in just so many different of these, these public forums. Right? Then, then, then the lever switches. Right? You get to this hard market and if you listen to quarterly earnings for the last probably two, maybe three quarters, right? <laughs> the, the talk track really is around, you know, we're getting a bajillion points of rate. Right? You, they can't talk about how much rate they're getting. Never mind how disruptive this is to their policyholders and their clients, but it, it becomes a, a badge to be able to talk about how much rate. Right? And then, that, then you go to the next side and you, then you'll hear for usually about another three or four quarters, you know, this kind of balanced approach of, of maintaining positive rate on renewals and, and uh, writing new business at, at profit objectives. So that's what you hear at the, at the you know, pretty consistently at the C-suite. Let me open it up and maybe the chatter, I think we're using the Q&A, maybe war stories around. So when it's strong profits, experience from this group in terms of like, what do carriers really do? Like, how does that manifest itself? Right, so one, I'll just kind of see the, the conversation. We'll see what else we get. Um, right, you're going to see very, very aggressive new business pricing. Right, you're going to, the underwriters, you'll take a look at some of these and you're competing in the market and you'll just say, I can't believe someone did that on this risk. Right, you see extremely competitive pricing. Let me see, is there anything else? What else, what else do we experience in, uh, in some of these markets? Please don't leave me hanging here. It's just myself talking for an hour. Let's see, anything in the Q&A or the chat coming through from the Tamar group? Nothing as of yet. Nothing yet, all right. So I think, you know, when you, let's see. All right, we got nothing. So I guess you guys are all leaving me by myself to, to, to fill in the blanks here. But when you, when, you, when you tend to see strong profits, that's when you're gonna see things like carriers getting very aggressive on new business. You're gonna see expansion in product or states. You're gonna see crazy new business commission schedules that are put out there, right? So anything to, to continue to write more and more business. From an underwriter perspective, um, many times you also see uh, a, a significant reduction in, in the quality of submissions. Right? People will write anything with, with limited information because they're just so hungry to write new business. <laughs> That's all right, sir. We have uh, one of them, what do you see in, in that strong, when the strong profits, the throws of, of a, a soft market, a lot of stress, right? And so it's, it's a challenging time, although, although the profit is good, right? It is highly competitive. You're seeing competitors do things that every day you kind of take a step back and, and just question yourself, kind of how they're doing this, how they're gonna survive. And usually you're right. It's usually not gonna last long. At some point that does catch up when folks, um, you know, expand their appetite or pricing way too thin and the market, market cycle continues to go forward. Let's go to the other side. You know, what happens on, the, on a hard market? How does that manifest itself in, uh, in the marketplace and, and some of the competitor actions? All right, so it'll be me. I'd say so in, in this, what you tend to see in the, the harder market is all of a sudden there's gonna be, you know, um, rates are gonna go up, especially on renewal business. Many times you'll see that very broad spread, peanut butter for, for many, many different risks. Uh, you'll see a much higher standard for underwriting submissions. The quality of the information that the agents are going to have to provide is going to be increased. Capacity, if you're in the property lines or an umbrella, what you're gonna see is people start to shrink limits that they're providing um, or, or capacity in that regard. So you see a lot of that type of activity. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, we, we actually had a comment more than a question. It was uh, yeah. um, frustration from our agency force. Yeah. That's what they. <laughs> I think there's frustration on both sides, right? Because a lot of times, you know, in both the, the hard and the soft market, there's, there's frustration. Um, because a lot of this, if you think about the customer experience, the agents are now explaining to their customers, you know, at one point, your highly attractive risk, you know, the, the marketplace is fawning over itself to, uh, to write that in very aggressive terms and conditions. And then the risk is exactly the same, you know, two, three years later, 
and all of a sudden the premiums are going up, capacity is going down. And so it's, it's not a great experience. And I think frustration is a greater word for both the agents as well as the policyholders. And so you see these just wild swings. So there's not a perfect, you know, not necessarily one stage is hard or soft is better or worse, um, but there's, they're, they're very, very different. Um, and I think they can, uh, they can be equally frustrating. It's a great appreciate it. And Eric, thank you very much for, uh, for participating. So let's see, so where is the market now? And so one of the, the areas that we, we uh, like to watch is the CIAB. So the Council of Independent Agents and Brokers, and every quarter they'll report out in terms of what they are seeing. So this is from the agent perspective, you know, that they're seeing their clients. What are the rate changes that they're going to be, uh, that they're seeing in the marketplace? And so up here in the, the top left, here you'll see in the second quarter of 2020, and here it is by line. So you've got commercial auto, which has been in a, a hard market for probably six years. We'll get into a little bit of that. It's still at about 10% rate increase. Workers comp, it is the one line. So if you listen to especially earnings calls from these stock companies, they, they always talk about rate X comp. And I know we've got a session uh, after this in terms of the, the, the comp marketplace, but it, what you see there, and it's, it's very different by state due to the nature of comp, but what you see, it's a very soft market. I think there's some, chine, some changes that it's moving to, to firming. It's not hard, but it's a, it's a marketplace in transition. You've got commercial park property at about 13 points. General liability at seven. Umbrella, just talking about you know, capacity. So the rate online that folks are getting going up about 20%. So on, on average, uh, you'll see a, about a 10% increase. And so from, from my perspective, this is probably the, the most significant rate changes across the board that we've seen uh, in a decade. So those, those underwriters who, you know, less than 10 years, you know, probably have not seen a, a marketplace like this, and it's very, very different. In the top right, what you'll see is just over time, a time sequence. How have those rates changed? So commercial property, you see really this, uh, you know, it was negative from 14 to 17, so rate reductions were the norm. As you start to see cat activity, capacity dry up a little bit, you start to see that the increase in trends there. DNO. You'll just see you know, an explosion really flat for about seven, eight years. And in the last four quarters, just a significant increase up to second quarter, which was 16.8. And then umbrella, again, you're actually seeing negative rate in for about five years here. And then just an acceleration of, of the pace of, of change quickly. Also see it by other lines, just some of the other the, the ancillary lines. And so what you see here is that the, the current marketplace is such that you know, it's pretty consistent uh, whereby, you know, rates are, are changing at a, at a decent clip. So I think the, the, the key component of this is, or, or, or I think, is then understanding why. You know, what is driving this? And, and so as we look at this and, and study the marketplace, there's really three trends that we'll go into. Um, in, and so one is the amount of surplus that's out there. So there's, there's, there's more, more supply than, than demand right now. The interest rate environment. So we think about how carriers make, make, uh, make income. There's a combination of underwriting income and investment income. So the, the interest rates being down at such a low level and be there for the foreseeable future puts a, a quite a bit of strain on the industry. And then the third one, a lot of folks are, are watching our, our loss trends. And so not necessarily normal, usually losses go up every year, two, three, four percent pretty consistently. What they're looking at are step changes in those results. What's changing in the environment? Like hard and soft markets are not caused by any one competitor. It's such a fragmented market that that just doesn't happen. They're really uh, outside in causes that create that change. So let's go through, uh, through each one of those. And please stop and chat if, um, if there's any questions in terms of uh, either the data or some of the assumptions underlying it or just questions in terms of experience. And so let me go to, to supply and demand. So the, the two key components here are premium and surplus, right? So I, this is from the, uh, the recent um, NAMIC Aon study on the, the state of the marketplace. And so what you'll see here is, you know, written premium for the industry. So it's about $638 billion of written premium and surplus supporting that was $865 million in, at year end 19. And typically when you, when you think about this and what you see is from a, from a rating agency perspective, so the strength of the promise that the, the carriers are making, surplus is a great thing. 
right? The more you have, the more financially secure you are, the ability to you know, absorb any bumps in activity, if there's cat activity or anything like that, you know, the idea traditionally around having surplus is, you know, more is better. What you see here, and I've split it between stock and, and mutuals, the, the leverage, which is premium over surplus, is pretty consistent between the two. What you see is the size of the circles, the, the disproportion there, and the fact that surplus is growing at a much greater rate than premium. So for stock companies, you look at this orange, so probably about 60% of the marketplace, right? they're fighting for capital from investors. And those, as we looked at the, the Fortune 500 return on equity versus, versus the PNC, you know, you're starting from a lower base, but now you've got all the surplus and, and their need to generate a return for their investors. But the beauty of the mutuals is right, we think about what, you know, one of the primary goals of, of a mutual and financial, of financial success is just that is growing surplus. So this doesn't really create the fact of the, the strength of the industry for the mutuals that surplus is growing. That's a great thing. For stocks, it's a, it's, it's a double-edged sword because what they need to do is now they have a larger base of surplus, they still need to generate the same percentage return to get, to get capital. And so right when the base goes up of surplus, that means the dollars of income need to increase. And so that puts a lot of pressure on the combined ratio. Let me stop there. Any questions or, or comments or? No questions showing right now, Kevin. All right, great. Right, so, so that's one of the key, so this is again, this is an industry specifically uh, focused on the stocks because of the, the financial metrics by which they're held to. And so the other piece is, so when we think about the, the insurance company and the, the income that they need to generate, you've got the underwriting side, and then you've got the investment side. So underwriting side is going to be driven by the combined ratio, and then investment is going to be driven by their, their return on assets. And so what you see here is this, the, the chart on the right is net investment yield. That just keeps, that's dropped. And if, you know, in the, the beginning of the financial crisis, you know, interest rates dropped and everyone said, oh, they can't go any lower, they can't go any lower. I was had the opportunity, I was running national accounts at that point, which, which is really dependent on interest rates and said, it can never get below three. Like that just, can't. and so reality, it, ju it just keeps dropping. And so that really manifests itself for challenges for the marketplace where that investment income just keeps dropping. And as we look forward, um, again, we'll, you know, there's, there's high likelihood that is gonna continue to be a challenge there. And so what that does is right, that puts more and more pressure on the underwriting income. So the ability for carriers or the need for carriers, especially stock companies, to be able to generate underwriting return, meaning lower combined ratios, becomes really acute. So that's a that's a that's a, the second component. You've got too much surplus, and then you've got investment income being down so much. The third piece is, and this is really so the, the third component of the, the driver of what we're seeing in terms of the, the real hardening of the market is then with regard to the, the loss trends. I mentioned it's not necessarily the challenge for the industry isn't necessarily when, when losses are going up as long as it's predictable. It's when things change, what I'll call a step change. Something in the environment happens that, that, that changes results. And so we'll go through a few of these and, and there's varying degrees by which these are impacting different lines. But you've got increased large loss activity, you've got social inflation, uh, cat activity, and then economic uncertainty. Again, these don't necessarily hit any one company in particular. These are macro issues that, that impact everyone and therefore it, it impact the results of the, uh, the entire industry. And so let me just quickly go, and I don't want to get too actuarial. I know Mike covered a lot of that this morning from the, the DOI, and, but just generally, you know, one of the, the challenges but also exciting parts of the insurance industry is one of the few industries where right, we're pricing a product where we don't actually know the cost of goods sold. We're pricing in what we think is going to happen over the next few years and those costs associated with it. And so, right, so if we're just looking at workers' comp here as an example, the dotted blue line is, or sorry, the, the heavy blue line is the actual severity over time. And then you can fit a line to that, and that's the dotted line. And so it says basically, you know what, over 30 years, severity is going to go up three and a half points. Right? In any one year, it may be different, but on average, and we've priced that into the long term, you know. 
will be, on average, will be okay. And so the example here is, you know, in 2004, you price actuary prices an account. They assume it's three and a half percent. You actually see in that period, it's above the dotted line. So you're actually having greater inflation than three and a half. So what ends up happening is, is carriers misprice their product by about 8%. Right? It's normal. This is how the industry has always worked for, for centuries. Uh, then what ends up happening, you, you have the opportunity to reprice your the, the next risk in 2009. You assume it's 3.5% trend over time. It actually is only 1.4. And so the carrier makes a little bit more money than they had expected. Like that's, that's, this is just kind of normal actuarial work that gets done. And as long as that dotted line, line stays consistent, uh, the industry can, can perform very, very well. What causes a lot more angst within the, the, the industry is when there's a step change. And so here what I'm using is uh, the example of commercial auto. So I mentioned earlier, right, commercial auto, the, the average rate change still about 10%, and that's, that's four or five years in the making that have just consistent double digit increase. And, and so what happened here, it's what's interesting to see is if we look at the, the results for commercial auto in the 2000s, it was actually for the industry a very profitable line. You know, making underwriting income, profit combined ratios in the mid to upper 90s. So people making money on the underwriting side as well as the investment side. And so it was, it was a line that performed. It was like a long time ago that that happened. Um, but it was, it was a, a line that was, uh, that was um, helpful for, for companies to, to grow both top and bottom line. What you started to see is with that results, like the, with, you know, and this, is, this is typical of the market cycle, when things start, are good, you start to get more capacity, more carriers start to, to come into the, the, the marketplace, people who might not have written monoline are now writing monoline. And so you saw this steady creep of, of combined ratios going up. You'll see that through 2010 to 2014, you see a steady increase. It's interesting then if you look back and see, then there was a step change. We were looking at, and I was, you know, had the opportunity, I was running a commercial auto line and book and small commercial at the time. And you look at that period, 13 to 14, large losses just took off. They, you talk to people, was it distracted driving? Was it crowded highways? It was a, a myriad of issues, but there was just a significant change from 13 to 14. And so what you see is the, the results in 15 through 18 change quite significantly. And so the issue here is so when there's a step change in these loss results, there's really this double whammy for the industry. And this is why you tend to see knee jerk reactions. The business that was already written previously is viewed as not as profitable. Right? So a book you might have thought you're making money on is no longer performing well. And usually what you're going to is your assumptions are going to be that it's going to get even worse going forward. So you kind of have this double whammy of my old stuff wasn't as good as I thought. And going forward, it's going to be even worse. And that's where you see this, this significant change in the marketplace pretty quickly. So what, what changes, what, what are some of those other areas that, that drive these step change in results? So you've got, you know, large losses. So just, you can look at a bunch of different lines. So workers comp, you see just a relatively, and these are for, so these are large claims over $3 million. So very large claim. You'll see steady increase, but then 16 and 17, over $183 million claims. Other lines, right? And so a lot of that's going to be attributable to advancements in, in medical technology and the ability to actually, you know, to, uh, to provide solutions for folks who are unfortunately hurt at work. Uh, the, uh, from the insurance side, that, that costs a lot more money with those advancements in technology. So you see just an explosion of these $3 million plus claims. Fire claims. A lot of activity and, and conversation now, just what's happening in, in large fires, uh, both personal as, as well as commercial, um, just an, an increase there. Commercial auto, these nuclear verdicts, the, you know, above, you know, 300% uh, increase in seven years. You can't price for that. There's nothing in your history that really would say, okay, if I'm pricing my, my risk for the next couple of years, I'm going to expect a 300% increase. Like that's, that's not in, really in the realm of possibility, but it does happen. DNO, so you see 17, 18, just a, a massive increase in director and officer uh, claims. So you see some of these step, trend, step changes in large lost activity. Next one, social inflation. And so I, I can't take credit for this. Uh, we had one of our, our um, 
one of the companies we work with at a Halloween party and it was insurance themed and, and one of the underwriters got dressed up as social inflation. And so they had the, the Facebook and the balloon, which I just thought was, was hysterical um, as an insurance geek. So <laughs> share it here, I don't take credit for it, but I uh, thought it was a good representation. Uh, and, and this is a theory that's, that's being kicked around a lot uh, and talking, talked about in a lot of different forums, whether it's the insurance magazines or earnings call and those sorts of things. It's not necessarily all that well defined, but what you see is these reported drivers, you've got inflation, um, higher verdicts. So people feeling there is, you know, that companies should be, especially on the commercial side, should be held liable for things they should have done uh, with the information they had. There's ideas of litigation funding. So, you know, people able to hold off in terms of settling awards because the, the litigators are getting paid in the interim. They can hold out. They don't need to just settle to get a, a quicker settlement and payment in cash. They can hold out. That creates more, a longer tail. Bad faith, you know, change in societal expectations. And so there's a, a, a myriad of things, and this is very much focused on the liability lines, or general liability, even umbrella, DNO, these areas. And, and so this is a, a relatively, I don't think it's a new phenomenon per se, but more of a, an acceleration of the impact that this is having on, on the insurance industry. So again, a step change in results. Cats. So what, what we have here and what I pulled from Munich Re is a view of overall losses. So that's going to be the, the green line, even the blue line is going to be insured losses. And so over the last decade, you will see a pretty significant increase in, in both the insured and the overall losses. So, you know, there's still debate whether this is driven by, are there actually more cats? Are the cats more severe? Or is it people are moving into places that are more cat exposed? Um, and so the, those are all, you know, I think very uh, worthy conversations and debates. They, for the, the carrier side, it, the, the fact is they're paying out more losses. And so this increase in cats, it has to be used in the pricing. And the, the reason I, I, I decided to use uh, cats instead of for worldwide cats instead of uh, just the US is because of the fact that, you know, there's the primary exposure that all carriers have, but then especially with the mutual, you know, the, the heavy reliance that there is on reinsurance. And so within your geography or territory, there may not be specific cats, but many of your partners in the reinsurance, they're gonna have worldwide exposure. And so these areas, you know, that they're, they're gonna you know, pay these losses on a worldwide basis. And so they're gonna have to adjust their pricing. So hearing a lot about as people are going into their 1-1-2021 one, one, um, renewals, there's, it's a really pressured environment for, for many of these reasons. And reinsurers are one, they've got a worldwide exposure. And so you, you can see the, the pretty significant increase there. And then the last real, the real cause um, for some of these changes is, is with regard to the economy. And so the uncertainty, and I'd say the, the big concern here is, is the uncertainty with the economy. Um, if the, the top left here from uh, St. Louis Reserve, is the unemployment rate. And so you can see just the, the charts here that what's, you see the unemployment rate and then the gray bars are recessions. So the economy, as, as the economy goes, so goes much of the insurance industry, very, very tightly co uh, correlated to the results there. And so as there's more economic uncertainty right now, that creates uncertainty for, for the insurance industry. Sometimes, you know, recessions, I'd say, especially with, say, the comps line, um, what you tend to see is in an early, the early part of a recession, you actually get better comp results, typically, right? People are, tend to be concerned about going out and, and uh, filing a claim. But then in areas, especially, you see some longer recessions here in the 2007 to 2010 period, when there's no jobs to go back to, you'll start to see an increase in both the, the frequency and severity of, of some of those losses. And so the line is, that line in particular, but other lines as well are, are very tightly uh, connected to uh, the economy. If you look here, anyone in personal or commercial auto, you just see the, the huge change in just miles driven. So this is the 12 month miles driven traveled and just, you, we've never seen a drop like that before. So figuring out is that a good thing or a bad thing? We had a lot of conversations around the fact, right, from a frequency perspective, carriers saw in the second quarter a massive drop in, in frequency. 
but offset somewhat by or entirely by uh, by changes in severity. So fewer claims, but the ones that do happen being much more severe. And so what does that actually do? And Mike was talking about that this morning in terms of what does that actually do to the loss results? So as we think about that uncertainty, you know, it's a it's a big component of uh, of what gets priced into the risk and some of the challenges. Let me stop there. Those are the major causes of um, of of the the market cycle, and especially you know what drives a hard market and what drives the hard market that we're in today. Every cycle is a little bit different, but has similar similar attributes. No, it doesn't look like anything. Let's make sure we're good. So, so now I wanted to spend a little bit, you know, finish the, the, the conversation um, really with around what are the opportunities for, for mutuals to really benefit from this? And I, I do believe there are structural advantages um, to the mutuals to compete in this space. And so by that, what do I mean? The, the ability to you know, think about long-term, make decisions that are in the best interest for the long-term, that's a, that's a structural advantage that the, uh, the mutual industry has. The economic drivers being more about how do, how do we grow surplus as opposed to you know, how do we generate a, a specific return on equity. Uh, the, the orientation around policyholder. The fact, you know, let's not disrupt like these policyholders trust us to, to be a stable market and we're in the business for providing for our policyholders, not our, our shareholders. You know, so that orientation, that structural advantage, I think is absolutely uh, an opportunity for the mutual industry to, to take advantage of these, uh, these marketplace disruptions. Because I do believe, in, based on the history and based on what we see, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's alive and well, it happens. Um, it's mostly driven by outside in uh, changes in the environment. And so um, it's, it's going to happen. It's how, how do you manage it instead of being managed? And so a couple of things, right? Uh, I'd say, you know, the first one is that stability and pricing for policyholders. That's a, that's a key advantage. CEOs don't have to go out and talk every quarter about what they, their, their earnings in that period or in a hard market, how much rate they have can really make the decisions in the best interest of the policyholder over the long term. You know, another way, another strategy, right? The, the capital flexibility. So we think about the strength of the surplus in the mutual industry gives flexibility, right? To be able to manage, especially on the reinsurance costs. Reinsurers are a fantastic partner, play a critical role in the support of mutuals, right? But being having the flexibility when the rest of the market is, is uh, you know, having being challenged in terms of profitability and rates are changed, having that flexibility to figure out what am I going to net versus what am I going to keep gross? That's an optionality that many carrier mutuals have. And the last piece, right, being an analytics firm, it's always important to us and, and think there's a great opportunity here for clients to make sure they're leveraging their data and analytics. And, and by this, it's not, you know, as, as you think about managing the, the market cycles, it's not risk by risk that this is done effectively. It really is doing this on a portfolio of risks. So monitor, when are you making conscious decisions to invest in risks in new business? When is the portfolio getting challenged and need to make some adjustments? And how do you make this a, a smooth transition? So just some of the, the ideas here in terms of new business. Uh, one of the, I think, best practices we've seen with regard to, to managing new business is really monitoring what I'll call pure price, meaning what's the, the, the value of a risk, regardless of what the market says. From an underwriter perspective, I always believe, you know, there's, there's a, a, the right price for that risk. The marketplace then decides whether or not that's acceptable at a given point. And so having the ability here, where you see the blue line is just kind of that pure price, right? It doesn't change over time, but then the market price does change, right? At times, 80% of market is what it's going to take to win at times. And it's usually short lived, you know, they're probably able to get 115%. Understanding where you are in that, in, in that, that gap. So when you get to 60%, when you're down here in the bottom, right, you're really pulling back and saying, okay, this is not the right time to be writing new business. This is not sustainable. You know, the mistake that many, I think many carriers make and why the cycles continue to happen is they get the two of these mixed up. 
they, they, they mush them together and they say, well, it's a soft market and the, and, and the marketplace is telling me this is a better than average risk and I should have a very aggressive price. Um, that's not always the case. So the ability to, to really separate the two of them becomes important. So you're understanding where am I consciously making decisions to, uh, to, to adjust my new business price. You know, retention results, um, having more and more segmented views around the profitability of the renewal book. So truly understand instead of in here, right, the retention results, kind of the traditional approach is you know, everyone has, we, we categorize our risks based on attractiveness and profitability. Traditional approach is say, okay, everyone gets the same rate and you know, we're, we're trying to drive the same retention. More advanced approaches based on, you know, looking at the portfolio, whether it's good times or bad, there's always a part that's superior and there's always a part that's underperforming. That's just the nature of any portfolio. And so having the ability to manage that more, more on a more segmented basis for rate versus retention it becomes more and more important. So again, making conscious decisions and the ability to, to have a smooth transition. Right? And then the last piece is, is really making sure of a monitoring of, of loss trends to understand really what's driving the results. Is it, is it frequencies dropping real significantly and that's why losses are dropping? Or is, and is it being offset by an increase, increase in severity? And then the ability to, to truly differentiate, you know, what's, a, what's just lost trend and what should be included in our pricing versus what's changed, right? There really is a new reality we need to create and we need to react to that. So there is, uh, I think there's, there's, there's ways in which companies can do that effectively. Um, and top performance of the companies will, will do that. But again, just as, as we finish up, I'd say I think that um, I, I do believe because of the long the long term thinking, which is a hallmark of the mutual industry, as well as the commitment to policyholders, there really is a, a great ability to to manage the cycle and not be managed by it. And so, uh, with that, let me, uh, Randy, I'll turn it back to you. And if there's any questions, either from yourself or from the uh, the rest of the audience, we'd be happy to to engage in that for the next 10, 15 minutes, or however much time you'll give me. Okay. Um, thank you, Kevin. Well, let's wait a minute or two, see if anybody pops in with any questions. Um, oh, we do have, can you explain the reptile? <laughs> No, I've read it. I keep reading about it. It's kind of like blockchain. I keep reading about it and I can't, I can, I understand it when I read it, but then, uh, then to try to explain it is, is more challenging. And basically it, it's, oh, Randy Fulmer would like to answer the question. Oh, sorry. No, I'm, um, I'm gonna it's, a, it's a litigation, I guess, just overall, I appreciate it. It's, it's a litigation theory by which um, lawyers are using to create um, what I believe are, are, Seeds a doubt in the jury's mind that the the you know the defendant should have known or, or should have been doing something different uh, and manage that, and it it creates these uh, assumptions of liability that uh, that put a pretty high onus on the the, the defense. Okay, there's another one here. I, I I'm thinking you, maybe you can see these as well, Kevin. I can't. Yeah. So let me take that one. So Dan, appreciate that. So so the question for those who can't see it: What estimated rate increases do you see in property reinsurance based on the U.S. storms and fire cat losses in 2020? And so um, again, this is so I get this more from talking to clients who are going through this process now, um, and it, it seem seemingly and maybe there's reinsurance. I think no, oh, there's reinsurers who are on the line. It's seemingly around double digits. Like I haven't heard too many that are that are in the single digits. So seemingly because of a lot of the cat activity, a lot of it's going to be dependent on the book of business. So those who are in non-cat areas probably a little bit less, but those who have cat exposure, you know, those those rates are going up pretty significantly. If we go back to um, let me just look here, you know, the, the commercial property Q1, you know, 13.3. And, uh, but also point out here, what I'll, I'll show here is um, there's wide ranges around that. So within this column here, you'll see the average is 13.3. You did see some rate decreases. So minus 15 is here from CIAB, but then you also saw on the other side is 45%. So this line I think is just, is, is very much gonna be dependent on the portfolio, but seemingly it's in that, that, that low single digit number. Right. 
pay or not. The, the umbrella market question has popped up. I've been hearing that a lot lately myself. So what have you been seeing in the umbrella market that's been driving? Yeah, so I think, uh, so part of this is especially is um, how far the market had fallen. Right? So when you think about the rate changes that are going through now, you see when you see a multi-year view in the bottom, bottom right here is the umbrella market. So for many, many years, you were seeing rate decreases on rate decreases. And so your base became very, very low. And so what's happened, especially in the umbrella market, is you know a significant increase. You'll see here the average rate for second quarter was 20% in this column right here. And so high was at 52, low was at 14. And so I think what we're seeing here is a combination of rates going up and capacity being significantly impacted. It used to be, especially on some of the, let's say middle market risk, if they needed $100 million of umbrella coverage, you, know, you might be able to go to four markets and get $25 million each. Now what you see is, you know, maybe the lead will only be offering five and then have to piece together. And so this is where the wholesalers are ex exceptionally busy right now, is trying to find all the markets to fill out what used to be a $100 million umbrella is now might be 10 carriers, 15 carriers with higher rates and, and less capacity. Okay. I don't see any more questions popping in. So with that, I will thank you, Kevin, for your, uh, for your time and your, it, great information. Um, it is definitely a ever-changing market right now that we're dealing with um, and with still some unknowns into the length of this pandemic and what the ultimate impacts might be with that on, on long term. So right. um, great insights. I appreciate no, Thank I appreciate you for the opportunity. You. Right, yes. I especially stayed away from pandemic there being another step change. Um, I figure <laughs> there's enough coverage on that, but I, like those are other things that, that just are going to have a, a, a challenge for the marketplace. Yep. Well, so again, I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Yep. Have a great afternoon. Appreciate the opportunity. Okay. With that, uh, we're going to take a break, and I would ask everybody that we'll be we'll be starting again around two o'clock, maybe a minute or so after that for, with our next session. Um, and we will uh, be back to you shortly. Westmont Associates is an insurance consulting firm. If it involves insurance, Westmont can handle it. We have the ability to understand what our clients want to do, uh, take their innovative and creative ideas and turn them into something that a state regulator can understand and work with. We have global clients, we have local clients, but we strive to make each client feel like they're our only client.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the afternoon session. Again, for those who are joining us for the first time, uh, my name is Veronica Wilkins. I'm the co-chair of the committee, and I'll be introducing everyone on the Workers' Comp Update panel. So today we'll have Mark Powell, Nicole Carruth, and Angelo Ganguzel. Mark Powell Mark Powell works as a partner at Thompson Thompson and Hafer. Um, Mark's practice focuses on litigation of workers' compensation matters on behalf of employees and insurers across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. As a defense attorney, Mark has successfully litigated cases involving a range of matters that routine injury claims to complex occupational disease and occupational exposure claims. He has litigated claims before workers' compensation judges, uh, the Workers' Compensation Appeal Board, and the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania. Born in Steubenville, Ohio, uh, Mark earned both his undergraduate and law degree at West Virginia University. While at West Virginia University College of Law, Mark participated in numerous trial comp competitions. In his free time, he enjoys spending time with his wife and two children, playing basketball, and rooting for West Virginia University Mountaineers. Nicole is the Director of Workers' Compensation and Managed Career Care Home Office Claims at Penn National Insurance. Nicole has worked in this field of workers' compensation for over 20 years. Nicole started her career working uh, for a self-insured workers' compensation pool and moved to Penn National Insurance 17 years ago. Uh, presently, Nicole is handling workers' compensation claims program focusing on regulatory compliance across 13 active states, runs and managed care programs to ensure savings and quality services, monitor vendors' uh, services, and current secretary of the Central Pennsylvania CPCU chapter. Professional designations include Charter Property um, Casualty Underwriter, Associates in Insurance Claims Management, Associates in General Assurance, Associates in Claims, um, Associates in Insurance Services, and Senior Claims Law Associate, um, and Certified Workers' Compensation Professional and that's with Michigan State University School of Labor and Industry. Nicole is a graduate of York College of Pennsylvania. And finally, we have Angelo Ganguzo. Angelo is the Vice President and General Manager of Oak Ridge Operation. Um, he works for Pennsylvania Lumberland Mutual Insurance Company. Um, he's been with the company since April 2019 to develop and create and manage a new revenue source uh, for the organization. ABM will be that vehicle. He started his insurance career 34 years ago as an account representative for Lynn Insurance. Um, so he's worked for Alliance, LIG Insurance Agency, and he was responsible for the Metropolitan New York, New Jersey Territory. Angelo graduated in 1982 with a BA um, from Villanova University. He earned his CIC designation in 1994 and currently has eight of 10 CPCU courses completed for this prestigious designation. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to the workers' compensation panel. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, I'm Nicole. I'm going to start out today talking a little bit about proposed legislation and enacted legislation across some of our uh, local states surrounding COVID-19. I want to first off open by saying that COVID-19 workers' compensation litigation will surround presumption laws. In a typical workers' comp case, the claimant bears the burden of demonstrating a causal relationship between an injury and their occupation. COVID-19 is not a typical workers' compensation claim that we normally see. The nature of the disease, as well as the inconsistent testing and documentation, 
renders contact tracing an uphill battle for the average person. It remains difficult to prove when and where the disease was contracted, if it's even possible. States have turned to presumption laws to overcome this obstacle. Through the language of the laws, though the language in each uh, state vary, uh, they have the same general approach. If a worker tests positive, it would be presumed to have been contact or contracted at work. Currently, we have 17 states that adopted or considering presumption laws. I'm going to start out talking about Pennsylvania today and talk about what um, what's, we're seeing right now out there with the proposed legislation. First up, we have Pennsylvania House Bill 2396. This was filed back in April 13th uh, and it's in committee with no movement. PA legislator just completed its final scheduled voting session for 2019 and 20, so this will not pass this year, but it is still sitting out there in committee. Uh, this uh, bill would create a presumption of work-related hazardous duty for individuals employed by a life-sustaining business or occupation who is required to work, who contracts, has symptoms of, or is otherwise exposed to an infectious disease, including COVID-19 or any other novel virus or infection, infectious disease during the declaration of a disaster emergency under Section 7301 the declaration of a public health emergency by the Commonwealth of PA, by the governor or a pandemic, which results in hospitalization, quarantine, isolation, or other control measures due to infection or exposure shall have this presumption that the individual's medical condition or inability to work is, work, uh, is related to uh, work. Now, the big question when you look at all these presumption laws is, or legislation is, who would be covered if this passes? So in Pennsylvania, the definition of an individual employed by a life-sustaining business or occupation would be defined as a first responder, including your law enforcement officers, firefighters, emergency uh, medical technicians, uh, corrections officers, emergency service dispatchers, ambulance drivers, and here's where it gets tricky. Retail workers, including restaurant, food service, and grocery store workers, cashiers, and other support staff. That's a, quite a large group of people. Uh, food and agricultural workers, medical health care and public health workers, including your doctors, nursing uh, professionals, uh, paramedics, and other support staff. Pharmacies, pharmacists, and the support staff there. Home health care workers, public utility workers, uh, um, engaged in telecommunications, energy water, wastewater services, and public works, employees of state and local government, employees uh, that collect trash, warehouse workers, and any other individual employed by a life-sustaining business or occupation who is required to work during uh, the public health emergency. So as you can see, and Mark will talk about this in a little bit, that's a huge area to determine what employee would fall into that category if a bill like this had passed. Further in this presentation, we'll talk about New Jersey, who did pass a presumption law and talk about the broad base of employees it may cover. The other um, legislation out there in Pennsylvania that was also introduced in April but has not uh, passed quite yet is uh, Senate Bill, I'm sorry, House Bill 1189, which was amended and the House did pass it. Uh, this is basically protection for our first responders. Um, it's, uh, there's bipartisan support to amend the PA Work Compact to lower the burden of proof in COVID-19 for these first responders. It is predicted that some form of legislation will become law in the near future. So we do expect to see that across the board, um, and we have seen that in a lot of our states uh, so far. So. Now that you kind of know what's hanging out there for Pennsylvania, I'm going to send this over to Mark Powell to see what we can possibly say on a legal front in Pennsylvania. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, as Nicole indicated, uh, my name is Mark Powell, and I've been litigating workers' comp cases for a number of years in Pennsylvania. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what we've seen in terms of litigation thus far in relation to COVID. Uh, that's going to include some discussion about the foreseen and, and unforeseen consequences of COVID-19 and then talk about what we may see in the future. Now, I think it goes without saying that uh, 2020 has been a year quite unlike any other. It's been a challenge, I think, for uh, many people on a health front, a work front, a family front. Uh, we have new vocabulary uh, with, with 
social distancing and new normal and mask mandates. Uh, we've had great memes in 2020. And as someone once put it, it's, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, it's quite a different year when you're being chased out of banks for not wearing a mask as opposed to the opposite. So, um, <clears throat> As Nicole indicated, there is some legislation that's out there. Um, from an insurance perspective, uh, the presumptions usually do not help insurance carriers or employers. So what we can hope for from an insurance perspective is that uh, in true you know, legislative fashion that nothing passes until the pandemic is over and then hopefully it won't be nearly as, as much of a concern. What have we seen so far? Uh, in litigation. Uh, the expectation was that we were going to see a massive boom in cases, uh, that the floodgates of COVID-19 cases would open. We would see these in essentially two different forms. One would be your standard injury or death case, and the other would be through the occupational disease provisions of the Act. As Nicole alluded to, your standard injury and death cases involve your standard burdens of proof. That would be a case where someone alleges they had a specific exposure to COVID-19 at work, that as a result of that exposure, they contracted COVID-19 and that they experienced the need for medical treatment or disability as a result of their contraction of COVID-19. From a litigation standpoint, that requires factual proof of an exposure. It also requires medical proof uh, that you've actually contracted COVID-19 and medical proof of causation that whatever exposure you may have had resulted in your contracting the condition. Uh, basically, in workers' compensation, when an injury is not obvious, you have to have an unequivocal medical opinion establishing a diagnosis and establish, establishing that the diagnosis is causally related to your, your occupation. Uh, I think what you're going to see here, and then we're going to talk about this, is that we've not seen the boom of COVID-19 cases that we were expecting. Uh, for one, uh, the, the average mild case of COVID-19 only lasts 14 days. Uh, there's a waiting period in Pennsylvania workers' compensation where unless you miss you know, 14 days or more of work, you don't receive compensation for the entire 14 days that you've missed. Uh, many of the attorneys are not taking the COVID-19 cases that walk through their doors when you're only dealing with a period of disability of 14 days or even three to four weeks. At that point in time, uh, it becomes more of a uh, all risk and no reward type of proposition for the claimant's attorneys. They're going to spend thousands of dollars on securing the necessary medical opinions and, and taking the depositions necessary to establish from a factual standpoint the exposure to COVID-19 as well as from a medical standpoint uh, the causation element as well as the diagnosis and, and need to miss work. So uh, from a standard injury or death perspective, we have not seen the boom that we were expecting. Uh, and speaking with one of the larger claimant firms in Pennsylvania, they've not seen the cases walk through the door that they were expecting either. So I think from both sides, it's not what we thought it was going to be. Uh, from my firm's perspective, I think we've seen five litigated COVID-19 cases so far. Some of them have resolved quickly because of the nominal amount of disability at issue. Some of them which have some more nuanced issues and perhaps long-term effects are in litigation. Uh, we've not seen any decisions or, or how the judges are gonna be viewing the circumstances thus far. Uh, in addition to your standard injury or death case and analysis, it's also possible that uh, claimants can proceed under the occupational disease provisions of the act as Nicole was telling you about the various House bills, they're looking to create presumptive law dealing specifically with COVID-19. Uh, when the occupational disease provisions of the Act were enacted, COVID-19 wasn't a consideration. It didn't exist, and so there's nothing really specifically dealing with, with COVID-19. However, the Pennsylvania Workers' Compensation Act does allow for application of the occupational disease provisions even when someone contract, contracts something that's not one of the enumerated occupational diseases in section 108. Uh, when you're dealing with COVID, uh, many of the claimants are going to be looking at section 108N of the Act. This is referred to generally as the catch-all provision of the Occupational Disease Act. And uh, not to bore you necessarily with statutory language, but I, I do want to uh, read some of the language involved uh, in section 108N. 108N provides occupational disease coverage 
for all other diseases, uh, in other words, ones that are classified otherwise in Section 108, one, to which the claimant is exposed by reason of employment, two, which are causally related to the industry or occupation, and three, the incidence of which is substantially greater in that industry or occupation uh, than in the general population. So uh, as you can see, you could use COVID-19 as an occupational disease, and if you can meet those three criteria, you can invoke the occupational disease provisions of the act. Well, what does that mean? Uh, you have to read section 108N in conjunction with section 301E. 301E says that if the employee uh, at or immediately before the date of disability was employed in any occupation or industry in which the occupational disease is a hazard, it shall be presumed that the employee's occupational disease arose out of and in the course of employment, but the presumption shall not be conclusive. So what that means is if you can prove that you contracted COVID-19, that COVID-19 is a risk of your industry, and that there's a higher incidence of risk in your specific industry than in the general population, the judges are then permitted to presume that your COVID-19 is work-related. I think you're gonna see this used if we do see the influx of cases that we were expecting, predominantly with healthcare workers, uh, perhaps with teachers. And you know, at times, I think uh, some of your, your frontline workers at grocery stores will uh, try to invoke the, the presumption as well. But what does that mean from a carrier or employer perspective? Well, it means that all the issues a claimant would have through proceeding under a standard injury or death case analysis now become your problem. You now have to prove that their condition is not work-related, whereas under the standard analysis, the claimant had the burden of proving that it was. So all the issues they would face in terms of factual proof and medical exposure now become your issue in attempting to rebut the rebuttable presumption contained in section uh, 301E. <clears throat> As indicated, uh, we haven't seen the influx of cases. I, I think a lot of that can be attributed to the fact that we don't we know a lot about COVID-19, but it seems that what we know changes every day. And I think there's some uncertainty uh, in terms of the science involved. Uh, I think that there's some issues in terms of whether the claimant's attorneys will receive enough bang for their buck, so to speak, when litigating these cases. Uh, we're also gonna talk about this uh, as we move on, but when there is compensable disability related to COVID-19, a lot of that disability has been offset uh, based on the unemployment compensation benefits that have been received. Uh, you know, generally, when a person receives workers' compensation benefits or they're seeking workers' compensation benefits and receives unemployment compensation, the employer is entitled to a dollar-for-dollar -dollar credit for the net unemployment compensation benefits received by the claimant. Uh, that becomes an even bigger issue when you look at the CARES Act and the fact that there was this additional $600 supplement uh, being provided and administered through the state unemployment compensation systems. It's not to say that we're not fighting over that issue in front of workers' compensation judges, uh, but it's something that goes into the analysis, I think, when claimants' attorneys are deciding whether or not they're even going to pursue a COVID-related case. Um, I will say that there are some employers and carriers who've made a decision to not fight COVID cases. Some of the bigger health systems, I think, are are looking at it from a public's re public relations standpoint. Uh, and because the vast majority of the cases are 14 days or less, uh, many times there was, people are receiving salary continuation, their medical bills are being paid, and the carrier is not even issuing a bureau document. There's obviously some, some risks associated with doing that. Um, but when you're dealing with mild cases and cases that don't result in death or long-term impact, uh, I think some of the carriers are finding that you can simply pay the medical bills and see the case go away without litigation and without having to uh, fight the, the proverbial fight. So the expected foreseen consequences was the boom in litigation. We haven't seen that. Uh, what are the unforeseen consequences? Well, uh, the irony is that we've seen an uptick in litigation for non-COVID cases. Uh, we've also seen COVID impact a lot of the cases that we have been handling, whether it's at the claims level or whether it's in litigation. Uh, one of the ways we've seen COVID impact the cases is availability of healthcare services, as well as through availability of independent medical examinations. 
Uh, when you're handling a worker's compensation case, the first 90 days of disability is a very critical time to control the case. Uh, you're allowed to issue a document called a notice of temporary compensation payable. And over the years, the strategy has been to figure out a way you can stop paying benefits within that 90 day window so that you can shift the burden back to the claimant uh, to establish an ongoing entitlement to benefits. When COVID hit and the government shutdown started occurring, independent medical examinations were being canceled. And uh, many times you're relying on that independent medical examination occurring within that first 90 days to help provide you with a basis on which to shut down a case. Uh, similarly, access to medical care. Uh, people who were going to physical therapy three days a week all of a sudden did not necessarily have access to the therapy they needed to recover from injuries uh, that were legitimately sustained. Uh, that tended to prolong the disability in some of the cases. Um, in terms of cases that were in litigation, it was becoming extremely difficult to obtain an independent medical examination of a claimant if that claimant had underlying health conditions. Uh, judges were very reluctant to compel claimants to attend an evaluation if they had some of the comorbidities uh, that would have resulted in a COVID-19 exposure becoming fatal. So uh, cases which you know typically are litigated within 180 to 210 days in the workers' compensation system are now spreading out over the you know, better course of nine months to a year. So we're seeing a delay in the administration of cases. Uh, with that being said, I thought workers' compensation overall did a pretty good job of adapting to uh, some of the uh, difficulties that were encountered encountered rather with the, with the pandemic. One of the other issues we're seeing is the impact of the government mandated shutdowns on businesses and its impact on people who are uh, working but under restrictions. Uh, there's a long line of cases in Pennsylvania where if a person is working under restrictions and their employer closes their business or lays them off due to economic downturn, uh, that there's a presumption that the loss in earnings is related to the work injury. Again, this deals specifically with people who were working under restrictions when a business was closed or when a person was laid off. Uh, in those cases, the law said the presumption is that the person is experiencing work-related disability and they're entitled to a reinstatement of benefits uh, unless the employer can demonstrate circumstances demonstrating that they shouldn't be entitled to a reinstatement. Again, we're dealing with you know one of these quasi presumptions that we've we've discussed earlier or a rebuttable presumption uh, you know conversely if a person was working under restrictions and they were terminated for cause or they voluntarily quit their job they generally were not entitled to resumption of their workers compensation benefits here uh, we're dealing not with conduct on the part of the employer we're not dealing with conduct on the part of the claimant we're dealing with conduct on the part of the government uh, which essentially told everyone you can't operate your business and you can't go to work. So we have seen a number of cases uh, in litigation over whether or not a claimant's entitled to a reinstatement of benefits when they've lost their employment and ability to earn wages due to a government mandated shutdown. Uh, we've also seen this issue arise in cases that were already in litigation where someone had been working under light duty and all of a sudden that stopped as a result of the shutdowns. Uh, I will say that I've not seen any decisions on the issue. I've had some off the record discussions with some of the judges and as you can imagine, uh, many of the judges have different opinions on how the issue is going to play out in the court system. Uh, but we've not been chased out of the hearing room with the argument yet, so it still remains a viable argument on behalf of employers. <clears throat> we have also seen incre increased litigation, uh, I would say across the board, uh, for what I like to call questionable claims. We have seen a lot of claims that we normally would not see in litigation making their way to litigation, whether it be medical only claims where there really were no disputes, uh, whether it's marginal hearing loss cases that normally wouldn't have been fired or filed rather, or uh, whether it's a case where there was clearly some questionable conduct on the part of the claimant or some shady facts. Uh, I think that the downturn in, in, in work, the, the government mandated shutdowns have resulted in less work for the claimants attorneys, or I guess less legitimate work. And I think they've been out there shaking the proverbial trees and have been a lot more aggressive in terms of what they're willing to file these days. Uh, I, I think that uh, in the industry, 
we felt as though there was likely going to be a slowdown as a result of the lack of work that we saw back in the earlier part of the year. Uh, I can tell you from my perspective, uh, the litigation is just as busy as, as it's ever been, if not busier. And I do think that's uh, in part because a lot of these collateral issues that are coming, not because of COVID-19 diagnoses, but because of the collateral of what the government's done and what, uh, what the employers have to do as a result of the pandemic. Uh, that coupled with, I think, some, uh, some aggressive tactics by the claimant's attorneys really were uh, pushing this in the opposite direction. Uh, we already talked about this briefly, but the CARES Act, uh, every claimant's attorney out there is arguing against application of the CARES Act unemployment supplement. Uh, there's some case law back from the, the old steel dumping days uh, where benefits were payable under the Foreign Trade Readjustment Act. They're relying on that case law where the court found that employers weren't entitled to a credit. However, there's been subsequent case law that clarified the unemployment compensation credit application, which is favorable to employers. Uh, the manner in which the CARES Act was written also created more of a system that flows through the states as opposed to being a pure federal supplement. So we believe we have pretty strong arguments on that and it's gonna be something that can be used to mitigate uh, exposure as it pertains to the, the pending workers' comp claims. Um, one of the other interesting areas where we've seen an uptick in litigation is from injuries sustained by people who did not want to come back to work after the pandemic. There were a lot of people who were very comfortable uh, receiving their unemployment and their $600 supplement. Uh, there were some people who legitimately did not want to return to work because they had high-risk members of, in their household. Uh, for which they feared potentially contracting COVID and taking it home. Um, but we've had a number of cases come through litigation where a person fought the uh, employer on returning to work and lo and behold, within you know one to seven days of returning to work, we have an unwitnessed injury. And next thing you know, a denial and litigation. Um, one of the, what I'll call the unforeseen benefits of the pandemic has been, uh, how to deal with the 90 percenters. Um, you know, we've all heard the term one percenter out in the media, which is the top income earners in the United States. In workers' comp, we have the 90 percenters, which is the uh, lower end of income earners. When a person's a 90 percenter, they receive 90 percent of their pre-injury pay tax-free as their weekly workers' compensation benefit. Uh, we normally run into problems when we're dealing with the 90 percenters because when they realize they can receive more money by staying home on comp tax-free, than they could bring home for working a 40 to 50 hour work week, there's often a reluctance to go back to work voluntarily. What the CARES Act did uh, with the $600 supplement is it resulted in some people reaching out and voluntarily signing off on their comp claims so that they could turn around and collect the unemployment compensation in the federal supplement instead. So a 90 percenter who maybe had a three or $400 per week average weekly wage resulting in a 270 or $360 comp rate is all of a sudden receiving an unemployment comp benefit plus an extra $600 a week. I can tell you prior to COVID, I could count on one hand the number of times people voluntarily signed off on a comp claim. Uh, but we've seen, we've seen quite a few occasions where that's happened since COVID. And it's generally when you're dealing with the people in that 90% range. <clears throat> Probably one of the more significant uh, issues that we've seen is the attempt to, to pierce statutory immunity. Um, as you're aware, employers are immune from civil suit if they have workers' comp insurance. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that. Uh, one of the exceptions is when an injury is intentionally caused. There's been at least one noteworthy case filed in the Philadelphia area against a rather large meat packing company. The, uh, the allegation was that the employer knew that its workforce was infected with COVID and exposed its employees uh, anyway. There is a case that dealt with uh, an employer intentionally exposing, exposing its workforce to lead in the past. Uh, the facts are a little bit different than what you see in the COVID cases. In that case, the employer had hidden the lead test results and when they finally did turn them over, they actually manipulated the results. Uh, and that was one of the few occasions where courts have actually found the ability to pierce statutory immunity and go after an employer directly. In the cases that we're seeing uh, filed seeking to pierce statutory immunity now, it's mostly in cases where there wouldn't be much of a financial benefit to anybody in the comp case. Uh, 
the case that was filed was a death case. There were no dependents. Uh, the exposure when there is uh, a death case with no dependents is simply payment of uh, capped funeral expenses and uh, medical to the extent medical treatment was provided prior to death. Uh, when you file a suit in, in common pleas or federal court, you then have the ability to seek compensatory damages and in suffering punitive damages. Uh, and what ends up being a few thousand dollar case from a workers' comp perspective can turn into a multi million dollar case, uh, particularly where it was filed in the Philadelphia area. So uh, that's probably one of the other unforeseen consequences we've seen is people trying to circumvent the workers' comp system in an attempt to obtain uh, higher monetary uh, settlements or, or verdicts. So it tells us a little bit about some of the foreseen and unforeseen consequences in comp. Uh, what else can we expect to see in the future? Uh, well, one is the vaccine. Uh, we've seen a lot of news over the last week regarding uh, what appears to be a promising vaccine. Uh, a lot of times with vaccines, you're gonna receive questions from your employers as to whether or not that can be covered under workers' comp as a preventative health measure. Uh, you also are going to have employers who are going to mandate uh, vaccine uh, for people who are in the healthcare industry, perhaps teachers, perhaps the grocery store people. If an employer mandates uh, receipt of a vaccine and the vaccine application results in complications, those complications can be considered a work-related injury. So. Generally speaking, the vaccine uh, should be something that's very good, uh, but it does have some potential to result in workers' comp exposure. Uh, we have litigated cases over the years resulting from uh, adverse consequences uh, from, from vaccines. I think you're gonna see some claims uh, when we are returning people from the workforce who are deconditioned. Uh, we have a lot of people who have not worked for a while. Uh, we all know what happens when uh, when you sit at home in a pandemic, if you've walked around your neighborhood on the day before trash collection and have looked at the recycling bins, you can see what some of the, uh, the favorite pastimes are these days. And when you have people who have physically demanding jobs, sitting at home, not engaged in physical activity, unable to go to the gym, you're inevitably going to see some injuries when they go back to work. So I do think that, I think by and large, our industries have opened up. We have seen a few of these cases already, but to the extent we continue to open back up, uh, I think you'll see more and, and more of those claims. I think you're also going to see some spite or retaliation claims. Uh, there were a lot of people who were furloughed early on in the pandemic uh, in conjunction with the government shutdowns. And uh, by necessity, a lot of employers figured out how to do their work more efficiently. They figured out uh, how to do their work, how to do more with less. And a lot of those people who were temporarily furloughed at the beginning are going to find themselves in a situation of a permanent furlough. And generally speaking, that does not leave people happy unless they really didn't like their job to begin with. Uh, you will see some spike claims resulting from that uh, where you know, you've never even had notice of a work injury and all of a sudden you receive that notification shortly after someone's advised that their, their job's gonna be permanently cut. I also think you're gonna see a trend uh, along these same lines in, in more at-home work injuries. Uh, we have had a shift in our workforce to a more remote workforce and just because someone's working at home doesn't mean that they can't sustain a work-related injury. What it does mean is that you're gonna have less and less proof to, to show that they didn't sustain a work-related injury. There are some, uh, some published opinions from the Commonwealth Court where people working in their home, going to get a drink of water from their home office, fell down the stairs, sustained injuries, and those injuries have been deemed compensable. Uh, there's gonna be, I think, a broader course and scope of employment when working from one's home. I think. You know, an injury sustained while switching up the laundry or fixing yourself lunch are going to be deemed part of the personal comfort doctrine and are going to be injuries that still fall within the course and scope of employment. I think one of the, the lessons to take from here is know your workforce, trust your workforce, and hope that, they're, that the people that are working at home are not the type that are going to try and manipulate the circumstances. So that kind of tells you some of the uh, litigation I expect to see and maybe some of the trends that we're going to see moving forward. I think talking to you uh, from a, a number standpoint now is, is going to be Angela. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. You know, I listened to uh, what Nicole and what Mark had to say, and I think uh, of that one saying where uh, this problem's like nailing jello to a tree. Uh, there really is no telling, you know, where this can go. 
um, if, you know, from an underwriting perspective, um, the, the blocking and tackling really doesn't change, right? The basics of what we would look at to determine whether a risk uh, met our particular underwriting guidelines uh, remains the same, right? I, I, I need to look at, we need to look at the data that's there. You know, I need to look at the rating information, and I and I think about that in terms of, you know, there's certain states now that might be more problematic from a uh, from a COVID perspective. I think of, um, uh, you know, what the exposures are. I think about, you know, one of the things that came about after 9/11 was employee concentrations. Are you in, you know, are you in areas where the employee uh, concentration is going to be higher? whether you're in a retail wholesale business, whether you're in a service operation or uh, a manufacturing risk and how that presents to the general public. Um, you know, I'm going to look at, again, I'm talking about the, what are the, you know, the basic characteristics. They don't change from an underwriting perspective. Um, I think one of the things that post COVID-19 uh, would, um, uh, would cause an underwriter to want to know more about uh, are things really focusing on, you know, management's attitude. Uh, what are the loss control and safety practices? Uh, what's the claims management processes that they uh, that they adhere to? Um, uh, you know, I, I want to know a little bit more, and I want to have some confidence in in what the corporate culture is in regards to these things. You know, unlike other classes of business, uh, you know, I can, if I were underwriting property, I could look at a building, I can walk through it and see if good housekeeping prevails. Uh, I could, I could look at a, a fleet of automobiles and I can easily tell, uh, you know, that the vehicles are well cared for, that they're maintained. The one thing that you can't do with workers' compensation is look at a person because you have no idea what they're going to do or what they're capable of doing. I could have a 20 year employee who, you know, maybe is going on vacation tomorrow. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, got a call from a family member and now has an emergency and they tried to do something or they exposed themselves uh, to a situation that normally they would not do. Normally you would expect that to be a, a result of a new hire. So training, Mark, you brought up the, you know, when employees come back to work, I think that's an important thing. You know, you, they may need refreshers of, of what good practices are. I, I think it's going to be critically important as we go forward to look at things like uh, social distancing, wearing masks, looking at what OSHA and, and, and uh, some of the other uh, organizations, CDC, say about maintaining, cleaning, and preparing, and, and, and uh, presenting your facilities and your people, all are going to be important. You know, it, it's interesting, on top of all this, uh, over the last five years in the United States, workers' compensation has been the most profitable line of commercial insurance business. It's operated at about a 91% combined ratio. Um, on top of the fact that over that five year period, rates have probably decreased on average more than 50%. Many states you look at this year are still, uh, are still uh, recommending rate decreases. What does that mean? Well, you know, payrolls are, so payrolls are down. Uh, the impact that it could have on experience mod uh, may or may not be, uh, may or may not be an issue. I don't know. Some jurisdictions are saying that COVID claims uh, are not going to be factored into uh, mods. Uh, so, you know, from a from a workers' compensation underwriting perspective, the focus still needs to be on uh, uh, the characteristics of the risk. One area that I think we probably need to focus on a little bit more is every workers' compensation policy has an employer's liability component to it. And that component says that, uh, you know, from a standard limit standpoint, they're going to, you have $100,000 uh, of coverage for a, uh, for a accident. You've got a half million dollars of coverage for a policy limit for disease. 
and you also have a $100,000 limit per injury for disease. I think from an underwriting perspective, we're going to really need to be aware of the request for higher limits with employers' liability. I don't think in the past it's been driven by pandemic diseases. It's been driven more by, uh, you know, what, what happens when, uh, you know, someone's injured and a uh, family member is impacted by it and they refuse the uh, liability benefits and they decide that they're going to go after the uh, work comp limits or a combination of both. Um, just something I think that, that as, as an underwriter in this class and, you know, it's just, a, just an item that we need uh, to keep uh, focus on. And then, you know, the last thing that I, that I think is, um, uh, is important is regardless of how good you are as an underwriter of this risk, there are going to be claims. And I think it is, and as we saw today, listening to Nicole and Mark, what's critical is to have a team behind you that knows what they're doing, uh, that is able to protect, uh, you know, employers, uh, carriers' uh, perspective. And um, uh, we know that probably of all of the lines of business, um, workers' compensation is predictable. And it really, truly is. History is going to be a predictor of future events. Uh, so it's just a, uh, I think it's just a uh, 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 important aspect. I don't know if, um, you know, what the long-term consequences of COVID are going to be. Uh, I don't think anybody does. Again, pointed out by both Nicole and Mark. Um, you know, we just need to continue to be resolute and uh, relentless in trying to, uh, you know, uh, the, our job as an underwriter in this in this line of business is to make a profit, right? We want to write profitable work comp business, uh, and and certainly with claims management that we have with medical. Uh, the delivery of, of medical uh, uh, capabilities has greatly improved. Improved, and I think that the uh, the legal environment has, you know, it, while constantly changing, it's it's improved as well for uh, from the comp perspective. So, uh, with that, uh, that's really all I have. Um, if if there's anyone that has, I guess now would be the time for questions, right? And I imagine more of them are going to be geared at what Nicole and Mark have to say. But thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I would um, just like to touch base real quick on one of our neighboring states in New Jersey. In um, September this year, Governor Murphy did pass a presumption bill, uh, which definitely affects the state of New Jersey. Um, uh, it was initially, it's actually a little bit better than it was initially proposed. Uh, but the bill, again, uh, surrounds what is an essential employee in New Jersey as far as who gets this presumption. Uh, we do business in the state of New Jersey, and since this bill has been passed, we still have not seen a workers' comp claim in New Jersey um, that would be covered under this bill. But I did want to talk a little bit about those essential employees. They include, per the language of the bill, public safety officers, again, first responders, healthcare workers. You see a lot of similarities with the Pennsylvania proposed bill. Um, anyone who performs functions um, that involve proximity to members of the public are essential to public health, safety, and welfare. Uh, this includes anyone who provides transportation services, hotel and residential services, financial services, those involved in the production, preparation, sale, and distribution of essential goods, such as food, beverages, medicine, fuel, and supplies for conducting essential business and work from home. So as you can see, it is a broad group of employees. Um, and at what point in New Jersey are the, you know, do we consider uh, these people uh, that they would fall into one of those coverage categories? Um, the bill um, does provide one benefit to employers. Um, claims paid uh, in accordance with this act will not be considered when calculating the employer's experience mod and rating. Um, so it will not impact premium. We, rarely get a good thing for employers, but that's one of them. Um, you know, and when we're looking at um, New Jersey, 
uh, it's, it's kind of scary. Um, I've talked to some of our uh, attorneys in the state of New Jersey. They have not seen a drastic um, outpouring of claims yet, but I, I, we can anticipate that, that we might see them. Um, could create a financial burden for uh, self-insured employers, work comp carriers that insure government workers, healthcare facilities, food services, and other industries involving, you know, uh, this, the sale and preparation and distribution of essential goods. Um, and we do believe that, that we will see an increase of COVID-19 uh, filings in the state of New Jersey. Uh, another thing to consider as a, a insurer that does business in the state of Pennsylvania, if you have employees working in the state of New Jersey and they're injured in the state of New Jersey, they do qualify for New Jersey workers' comp benefits, so they could get the benefit of this presumption. So I do throw that out there. Um, obviously, if they file in Pennsylvania, there's a dollar for dollar credit in the state of New Jersey, but that is an exposure if you have employees um, working in the state of New Jersey to be aware of. Um, I will touch upon Maryland because uh, I live four miles from Maryland. They have no pending litigation. So every state um, it is up in the air with where they are with um, proposed legislation, um, pending legislation, and enacted le legislation. Most of the states that did um, enact some kind of, of law, it does surround the first uh, responders versus, you know, this broad-based employee group such as the New Jersey bill. Again, if anyone has any questions. No questions yet. All right. Any final thought from the panel? It doesn't appear that we have any questions. No. Nope. Nope. All right. Well, I would like to. Um, I would like to thank the entire panel. I think this is some great information. Uh, I think you probably answered a lot of questions for uh, many folks in the audience. Uh, I think there's a lot to continue to think about and monitor and see how things pan out over the next six to 12 months and maybe longer um, as we move through and continue to move through COVID. So thank you again. I think this was a great session and um, we're going to take a 15 minute break and move to our final um, session of the day, the digital investment. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. for having us. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, would like to welcome you all back and thank you again for attending. Uh, we're getting ready for our last session of the day. Before we do that, I do want to mention um, kind of two things. Again, thank our committee members for their efforts in putting this program together this year. And then also putting in a shameless plug um, that registration is open to join uh, PAMIC committees for next year. Uh, we would welcome any additional or anybody that would like to be part of our um, underwriting and law prevention committee, please feel free to register at, at, on at PAMIC.org and uh, we will be happy to start working on this program for next year, um, early spring. Our last session today uh, deals with the topic of digital investments for both agents and policyholders. Uh, as we can imagine, uh, COVID has forced a lot of change in operations, one of which is, is trying to understand how to connect with your customers 
in the digital world more than ever when everybody's working re remotely. So today with us, we have a couple of individuals who are gonna share some insights and some thoughts on that topic. The first is Jessica Butler, the Chief Operating Officer at Mutual Capital Analytics. Uh, Jess has been there, has over 15 years in the PNC industry with personal lines and commercial lines backgrounds across products, pricing, process, and technology roles. Uh, before joining MCA, she worked at the Travelers. Uh, she had led efforts on many of their top cross-discipline strategic priorities for small commercial. Prior to that, she held leadership positions within the product management organizations for both small commercial and personal lines. She spent the first seven years in personal lines product management on auto and home products. And during her tenure, she delivered a 10 point loss ratio improvement in Massachusetts personal auto, as well as turnaround in the New Jersey auto book of 215 million in one year. In addition, she launched new products in auto and home across the Midwestern states, inclusive of rate level determination, competitive analysis, implementation and monitoring plans. She studied mathematics in her undergrad at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and received her MBA from the University of Hartford. In April 2019, she partnered with two friends to start the We Bear This Together Foundation to help support Connecticut families that are going through financial and diagnosis stresses as a result of having a child with epilepsy. In the first 12 months, the foundation raised over 17,000 to support this cause and create a formal partnership with the Connecticut Children's Epilepsy Center. In her free time, she enjoys golf, the beach, traveling, and spending time with friends and family. Joining Jess today is Chris Gerhardt, the Director of Information Technology with Millville Mutual. He's been working in the insurance industry for five and a half years now, and has spent a lot of that time developing and modernizing applications to enhance the entire insurance experience for Millville's policyholders, agents, and employees. Prior to joining the team at Millville, he was an IT system administrator for a large hospitality management company where he oversaw the IT operations for a number of restaurants, hotels, and nursing homes. He has a degree in information systems from Bloomsburg University and is also an Eagle Scout and an avid outdoorsman. So while he thoroughly enjoys all things IT related, his favorite part of IT is unplugging and getting outside. With that, I'll turn it over to the both of you for your insights. Thank you. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't catch what you were leading with Jess, but I guess Jess was telling you guys about uh, our topic, digital investments for both agents and policyholders. So we will uh, oops, jump in here. Um, and as we get started here, um, we're going to go through the, the quote and policy life cycle. And as we think about that, if you look at this slide we have here on the left hand side, um, Jess is going to take us through the framework that explains how carriers are modernizing the experience for agents. Um, looking at some digital improvements and some things we can do to uh, improve the, uh, the experience and to hopefully improve um, you know, the, the way we drive business with that. And then uh, we'll come back around and on the right hand side, we'll talk about the items in green where we talk about uh, the customer uh, specific focus and uh, things we can do as, as a carrier uh, to improve uh, life for our policyholders and for our agents and just make things really simple. So we'll start with the, uh, the, uh, the faster quoting experience and I will turn it over to Jess. Sure. So as you think about digital investments, really think about it two parts. The first part of the quote process is really focused on how do we make things quicker, faster, and easier for an agent. So I'm going to take you through the quote journey for an agent. And as we think about um, the traditional way in which we look at things and then how we actually modernize it and think about it more from a digital perspective. So you have a, think about the quote journey. You have 100 quotes created, and then there's a portion of them that move forward and a portion that falls off. And typically you, you um, fail fast on your eligibility quickly. So the agents find out that, yes, this I'm not gonna go ahead. This is going to provide me a decline. So you, you typically we see about 20% fail eligibility and about 80% moving forward. Of the ones that move forward, you have a portion after that um, 
that really once they get through the eligibility, they get through their rating screens, they see the they abandon after premium. Um, and we see about 35%, 30-35% fail um, after premium and, and the agent really abandons at that point. And that really is relative to competitiveness. Of the 45 that then move forward, they have intent to intend to issue and the underwriting questions come up. And so there's a portion of the, the uh, agents that actually fall off during the underwriting questions. And then there's a portion that actually moves forward. And if they move forward, there's a portion then that actually is referred um, and issued by an underwriter or it's actually issued by the agent. And so if you think about each part of the funnel, so failing eligibility, abandoning after premium, abandoning during the underwriting questions, and then having this referral trigger that they then have to touch an underwriter. And when you think about straight through processing as a carrier, what we've talked to a bunch of folks about is um, they, they understand that there's an internal perspective of our straight through processing is about 40%. So of the quotes that we issue, 10% of total 26 there um, were straight through process by the agent. If you think about it more from an external perspective and as you invest in your digital capabilities, investing in really how is that external perspective seen by an agent? And so as they think about it, if you're experiencing it as an, as an agent, they see a hundred quotes all the way down to only 10 go through, which is more of a 10% straight through process. And so as you think about where you can actually spend time as an underwriter, um, and when you think about how do I wanna increase straight through processing for my agents, really look at, um, folks really tend to look at like, what are my underwriting rules? Is there more I can actually let be issued by an agent? And I kind of, we kind of call that kind of that traditional approach. Whereas if you're dealing with it from an agent perspective, um, really modernizing your approach to really looking at across all aspects of the funnel. And so thinking about focusing on more of that 90% of the quote journey that has fallout rather than just that 16% and how do I, how do I move that green just a little bit over versus how do I actually take each aspect of this and do things a little different to modernize my approach and, and increase my straight through processing from top to bottom of the funnel. And so what examples or potential opportunities look like here as you think about it, so making it real, um, as you fail, fails underwriting, not necessarily changing or removing questions, it could be, but how do you actually rewrite declination questions on the user interface when you're making digital investments to improve that ease of doing business and straight through processing? So instead of asking 10 questions, maybe you ask, check all that apply. And I have an example in a slide or two. Oh, can you go back, Chris? Um, the, the next part would be uh, abandons, after, abandons after premium. And so those are really, how do you look at profile analytics? How do you model different attributes or leverage third-party data to increase your segmentation and your fill rates? Um, then the next part of optimization of that funnel is abandoning during your underwriting questions. And again, a lot of folks tend to think about this as a, how do I remove things versus a, how do you rewrite things and making that UI easier for the agent as you invest in your digital capabilities and using analytics to really think about and look at when, when questions are used, when questions are answered differently. Um, and then the last one is uh, referred and issued by an underwriter. And this is really, I think, you know, again, how do I remove rules from it, but really modernizing the approach and thought process on how do you reposition that referral underwriting rule to a different point in the process? For example, maybe you don't do a pre-issuance referral. Maybe you let part of it go through and you look at it on post-issuance and what might that look like? So we'll do some, some details here. So one example for um, failing eligibility and then abandoning during underwriting questions, again, the current traditional approach or current approach is I ask all these questions today. And from a user perspective, a dig, an agent, and as you're, as you're thinking about making inv investments in your digital, they have to make nine user actions for each one of those questions. The traditional approach of, of addressing how do I increase straight through processing might be how do I remove questions? So, and then the marketing aspect of that would be, well, I removed two of them. You can see the remove item 
which is about, I removed 25% in my question set. But I, <clears throat> what you're not thinking about is you still have seven user actions required. The modernized approach as you think about investing in digital and really not changing how your underwriting is, but really how you position it is you're, you position it as select all that apply to the premises, for example. And maybe there's, you actually have a reduction of the questions 55% of the time you can bind some. And then also here you have zero user required actions versus before, you know, you might have, but you, but you keep it at four optional um, actions. And so just, I, we've, we've worked with some carriers in doing this and really leveraging data and analytics in parallel with the underwriting perspective. So what we'll do is I'll get all the data of all the questions that are asked and answered and how they're answered. And then underwriting, I usually work with the COO or, or a leadership team of underwriting and they'll go through and say, which questions don't I want or, or could I remove or could I do less of? And I'll, I'll look at it from a data perspective. And then we get together and say, okay, well, you know, sometimes the, the underwriters will say, I need this question. And I say, okay, it's hit 99% of the time they answer no. Are we getting the value of that question? Um, and then a lot of times it's like, yeah, no, you're right. We're not, we're actually not getting the value of asking that question. And sometimes it's like, no, it, it runs 50% of the time we get an answer and that, you know, let's keep it. But then it's how to, do we want to rewrite it or reposition it within the UI? And so really using data and analytics to have one perspective while underwriting continues to keep their perspective and just kind of coupling together and partnering on that. Um, are there any questions? No questions. Okay. Um, abandons after premium. So a lot of times it, we work with carriers and they'll want to look at profile analytics or, you know, a lot of times, you know, how do we, how do we, have different attributes or use third-party data to increase segmentation. There's a lot of third-party data uh, vendors out there. How do we actually understand which one's the right solution? So a current situation is an agent submit has a submitted variable. So an agent is self-admitting the variable on the, on the UI. For this example, I used age of roof. If you want to appear to become more competitive, a traditional approach could be, well, we have to issue a discount. How do we issue a discount for this type of business? Um, let's put in a presence of the solar panel, either a surcharge or a discount based on that. Um, so you actually increase the number of questions on your UI um, in order to maybe become more price competitive in certain areas. Um, modernizing approach um, is, an agent submits the variable, but then you actually do a third party data call that has a fill rate of the high 80 percentile that looks at roof shape and the shingle type. And you actually move your pricing weight to, to validate that third party data and, and price on a, at a more, much more granular level. So you become more competitive within the cells of age of roof. And so again, just using some of that data and analytics and third-party data fill rates and match rates that are available to help your, your agents get through the process easier, becoming more, and while you guys are becoming, carriers are becoming more competitive on risks they want to, to compete on. Um, the last one is referred and issued by the underwriter. So really repositioning the referral rule um, within the within the quote within the process of issuing that policy. So for example, today, if you had a high deductible referral trigger, it creates a referral to that underwriter. The traditional approach is very binary. I have to keep the, the referral or I have to remove it. And removing a referral trigger is, is a, a tough thing for folks to do. An underwriting perspective of how you do this or not is a very binary approach. As we think about a modernizing approach is how do we actually set up a test to run post issuance underwriting on that referral and understand if we would have made a different decision on that risk for that referral. So would you remove the rule for X number of weeks allow the agent to issue it post underwrite with a single resource to remove any bias as to whether they would make a different decision on that risk or not. 
and then monitor the number reversed versus allowed and really evaluate that that quantifying the value of that underwriting rule and trigger in in that quote process and so if nine times you know nine times out of ten or ten times out of ten you wouldn't have, you would have issued the policy anyway then there's a, a stronger case to to feel more comfortable with underwriting it um you know on a on a outlier basis after the fact versus needing to underwrite it 100 percent up front every single time and so just using data and analytics and finding opportunities to underwrite different parts of the book um, that you haven't been competitive on or you haven't really played let agents issue in the past um, it really helps you evaluate that effectiveness as you expand that appetite of what those rules are and so it's just a nice way to transition into um, a little bit broader appetite, a little bit higher um, straight through process for your agents while still getting the underwriting quality that you want um, by just thinking a little bit differently of it. So from a from a quote and policy life cycle, I kind of talked about, you know, the two boxes in blue. So as we think about straight through processing, as you think about digital investments for agents, removing questions, rewriting questions, leveraging third party data prefill really encourage you to modernize think about it on a modernized approach um, and really focusing on the, the fallout at each point in the process versus just one item so that you can really get the largest bang for your buck relative to your digital investments for your agents. Um, so that was kind of that's kind of the quote side of the house. I'm going to turn it over to Chris to talk about the self-service capabilities. Once it's issued, how do you get into more of that um, capability self-service capability for the actual customer? Jess, before this is Randy, before Chris gets that, I actually got an emailed question to me. Um, and maybe there's a point where you're going to answer this, so I don't necessarily need an answer now. But the question really was: are there any studies that indicate what functionality producers want in portals? or related studies to measure how effective, you know, existing insurance portals are at meeting those expectations. Is there any work been done on that that you know of? I don't know of any. I know um, ex user experience is really hard to measure. There's a lot of studies out there on, um, and it's it's really, it's kind of interesting. I, I don't know too much about it, but really it, it actually takes like heat, um, graphs of the of the individuals as they're going through different portals or, or different experiences and based on how those kind of come together it tells them whether they understand whether the <clears throat> right screen bar and left screen bar size of the font and different things actually work it's kind of an, it's kind of interesting um, so it's much more user experience is very difficult to measure but um you know, I think I think if you focused on really the low hanging fruit and using some of the data and analytics that you you have within your your carrier um, data set already, I think you can gleam a lot from that and um, and okay. and have some of that hit some of that low hanging fruit. Good. Thanks. Yep. OK, I will hop in here. Um, so yeah, as Jess talked about, we really, you know, we started off this journey with the things that uh, agents can do uh, along with carriers to, you know, improve that the quoting and the issuance uh, component of it, which is, you know, super, super important and things we can do to streamline that. So now that we've got a policy, let's go talk about some of the components of, uh, you know, items that come up once we have that policy. And we'll start with onboarding. So you know, how can we make it easy for both the policyholder and the agent to interact with us now that they have this, this insurance product here? Um, I think number one, uh, a very popular one that's been out for a little while now, but definitely a winner for everybody is uh, e-sign, electronic signatures. Agents love it. It keeps track for them, uh, the signatures they're waiting on. It gives them ability to easily get a signature. Um, going the old fashioned way of getting a, a paper wet signature is, uh, it still happens obviously, but it's, uh, it's definitely going by the wayside. It, it's so much slower of a process. You think about the e-sign, um, you know, the agent's ready for a signature. They can just, you know, whip up, get the guy's email, send it out to him. And in a, in a perfect scenario, you know, say six, seven minutes later, the insured has, you know, looked over that, signed it and confirmations come back and it's done as opposed to, you know, the old fashioned way, which is we got to 
print this application off. We have to sign it as the agent. We got to put it in the mail to them. They get it. They sign it. They got to get a stamp back on it, get back to the post office, drop it back in the mail to us. Um, it's, you know, can easily be a 10, 10 day or longer process that way. Um, especially with the way the mail has been lately for us, uh, just the, the speeds we're seeing on it. So uh, definitely great for e-sign. I think policyholders love it because they don't have to, to deal with all the, the hassle of, well, I remember to sign this and get it mailed back. They can just do it instantly on demand. And I'll, I'll probably reference that kind of phrase throughout the, the rest of the portion of this presentation, just that, that instant capability for them and ease of access, because that's what we're trying to do is make it easy for them. Um, you know, making payment. Um, I'm sure if we were in person and I said, show of hands, who works for a company that offers some kind of electronic payment method, I would bet pretty much everybody's would go up. Um, but I think when we start looking at payment now, we have to look at what does payment in 2020 look like? Um, you know, for a lot of, a lot of insurance carriers, they've had the ability to accept electronic payment, you know, via credit card for a long time. But now you have policyholders out there who are used to dealing, uh, business dealings with other companies that are accepting options like PayPal, Venmo, Apple Pay, Google Pay. Um, and those things are becoming more and more prevalent. Um, you know, Apple Pay, Google Pay tied to the phones, obviously. And, um, you know, people like the idea of, hey, I can store all my payment information right here. And these companies, you know, have it securely locked up and do all these cool things with it. So why can't I use that to pay for my insurance also since I pay for everything else with it? Um, so it's definitely a feature they want. So we're, you know, I think as insurance carriers across the board, we have to start looking at what are the next level uh, electronic payment options because the, the standard level electronic payment options, while still very important and still used by a lot of people, um, there's, a, there's a big push now to start uh, migrating to some of these newer technologies and how that works. And then that rolls right into to the one that you know, my favorite one at the moment, because it's uh, something I've been working on a lot lately is our, um, you know, the policyholder app, an actual app on the phone. We know that a lot of our policyholders have smartphones and they're very comfortable with them and, and using apps on them. Um, we know that a lot of people that are, the, you know, the, the younger generation, obviously they all have a phone and it's a shock if any one of them doesn't. But we also are finding out that a lot of our older clientele also have a phone. Uh, you know, personally speaking, I, I know between my mom and my wife's parents, they are, you know, all in that, that 70s age range, and yet they all have smartphones and they use them and took a little while to get them trained on them. But now that they have them, they are actually like, hey, this is really great. Uh, did you know you can do all this stuff? And so, um, you know, it's not just younger policyholders, definitely older ones are, are into the phone uh, apps now. So, you know, it's a great way for them to manage their insurance. Um, you know, the device, it, it keeps everything central for them. Everything's right there, instant access to their life in an organized way. Um, and so we think, you know, if, if banking can do that and if your credit card can do that, why can't your insurance do that also? And then paperless enrollment, um, you know, kind of piggybacking off some of these other ones, um, getting away from snail mail, getting away from, from just paper in general. Um, everybody that has a device now, you know, hopefully they don't want paper anymore. They're, they're all realizing that they, nobody wants to keep receiving stuff in the mail. They can just get electronically. It's easier to manage, easier to track, uh, definitely easier for them to keep historical records because, um, you know, people keeping filing cabinets at home after you have years and, you know, months and months of bills or invoices or, or what have you, that takes a lot of space up and, and gets aged. Whereas on your phone or on your app uh, or on the computer, even it's right there and you can keep you know, years of data in a very small place uh, very easily. And it's easier for agents. I think we go paperless. We're not asking agents to uh, have to go get paper and send it out or keep track of it. Agents can go and reference the same things as the policyholders so they can see that, you know, whether it's two or three or five or seven year history, they can go back and look at all that stuff and it's all right there on demand. So now we have a policy that's totally in force. Now what? Well, definitely get them their insurance documents. Um, you know, going back to the paperless thing, that's obviously an option, but um, we wanna get them their documents as, as quickly and, and completely as possible. Um, I'll be the first to raise my hand and say, I have definitely uh, gotten my insurance renewals or gotten new insurance and forgot to, or new vehicles and forgot to print off my new auto ID card. Um, I've done it multiple times. Uh, luckily for me, I have the smartphone, so I can just, you know, download my, my insurance carrier has an app, pull it up real quick. Yep, there's my auto ID card, and I have it, so that's, that's wonderful. Um, 
it's, it's really nice for features like that. But also just for proof of insurance, you know, standard homeowners policies, if they have a mortgage, they need that proof of insurance for the bank. So being able for them to, instead of having to, you know, ask for a copy to come and then, you know, can you fax it here? Can you get to him? No, I can just email it to, to my bank officer because I've emailed him everything else and I can just log in right here and pull down my proof and there it is. Um, so really nice on-demand features for them so that, you know, the reason they're looking for it, they can get it and, and follow through with that without issue. Um, automatic payment or recurring payments, the, the uh, set it and forget it mentality definitely makes everybody's life easier. From our carrier standpoint, we don't send traditional bills in and wait for payment, which is, you know, if you think about it, it's a really long time when you send a bill out through the mail. And if this is a person who's getting a bill, there's a decent chance they're sending a check back. So um, till that bill gets to them, they write the check, send it back in. That's a long time. Um, automatic payments solve solve that issue uh they just you know we send a notice hopefully electronically and say hey you know it's time for your bill coming up make sure your funds are there make you have any questions let us know then we automatically take the transaction from a carrier standpoint you know we know we get a pretty good hit on our on our automatic payments that if, if they're set up an automatic payment we're going to get paid we're, you know less chance of insufficient fund type situations or just bad information because they paid us before so we know it's going to work um, I think agents really enjoy the automatic payment option because it takes it out of their hand. It's a transaction between the carrier and the policyholder. The agents ha have very little to worry about, uh, which they like, you know, less they have to do the better and, and absolutely for them. Um, it just resolves, resolves a lot of issues and really sets things up very well for them. And then one of my favorite ones that, that is something we've looked at that I think can be very helpful for people is, is linking policies together. Um, I actually just had a conversation with a policyholder yesterday who called me uh, about something else, but they just wanted to thank us. And they said, you know, I have actually five or six different policies with your company and I've had them some for a while, some are newer, but um, you know, in the past she would have had to manage all of them separately. And now she can link them all together on her app. So they're all right there. So she just pulls out her app, logs in, there's, you know, six different policies and anything she wants, she can print them off, she can pay them. She's a file claim. She can file a claim. Um, it's all right there. And it's really helpful because her policies don't all start and end at the same time. So uh, in the traditional paper method or the older way of doing it, you know, she, she'd be having communications coming in all the time, some for policy A, some for policy B, some for policy C. Um, this just makes it so much easier for them to, to keep track of it in one one-stop shop. What about our typical policy transactions like endorsements and renewals, things that we do all the time? Well, I think, you know, in the past, if I'm an insured uh, and I needed to make a change to my policy, I'm going to call my agent and start the process. And I definitely think that still has a place and still will have a place for a long time. But maybe in the future, we can streamline that step or, or skip over it to a point. Um, I, I really loved how Jess presented those questions on our earlier slides, you know, with the dogs saying, oh, you know, we used to ask all these questions and now we just say, hey, if this applies, check here and then we'll, we'll go into it further. So it just, wow, what a you know, great way to streamline that. I think we can do that with endorsements too. I think we could ask simple questions for a lot of the standard endorsements. And you know, as just mentioned too, you know, looking at your data, figuring out, okay, what, you know, you can look at your data and figure out what's the typical endorsements we do. Um, definitely address changes are, I'm sure something everybody does a lot of because it just happens. But we could ask questions like, um, do you want to increase your liability coverage and then lead them down that path or, oh, you need to change your address, lead them down that path. And then we can get some basic information, send it over to the agent and the agent already has a start on it, knows where they're heading with this. And it just can simplify and streamline the process. Um, maybe they, they want to make changes, but they just want to, you know, maybe they want to ask questions and find out different options. They have They just want to kind of fiddle with that sliding scale of, well, what if I do this or what if I do that? Um, so we can let them ask their agent a question directly, you know, right through their app and have the agent respond through the app. So now we've, we've created a mode of communication from the policyholder to the agent without them having to go out and look up their agent's phone number and, and, you know, make a phone call to them directly. We can kind of put it on the policyholder terms or better yet. One of my personal favorites actually is just maybe they don't even know who their agent is. Um, I'm sure there's people on this call right now going, yep, we've seen that too. Um, we get it a lot actually where people call up and, you know, I want to report a claim or I, I have questions about my insurance and okay, who's your agent? I, I don't know. I don't know who my agent is. Okay. So we can look it up. So 
that was one thing that Melville did with our app was he said, well, let's make sure we have easy access to their agent for them. So we actually show them, show them their agent, who it is, what the agent's phone number is. They can tap it, make a phone call, uh, show them a little location so they can map it if they want to pull up their phone to get directions to the agent's office. Um, yeah, that one surprised me, but it's actually a, a great feature. It's just giving them the ability to, to remind them because some of the people haven't talked to their agent in a long time, probably a year, maybe even longer. So they don't know who their agent is. So we can connect that information to them. And I really think that's the, the whole point of this, the, the whole digital experience is kind of trying to be like Google on the premise that we're simply trying to connect people to the parts of their lives in a very easy to follow manner. In this case, specifically that insurance part of their life. And since for a lot of us, it's, um, you know, you have multiple relationship with the, you have a relationship with a carrier and an agent. So now you have multiple parties involved. So how can we just seamlessly make those connections for them so they can um, do what they need to do and not be burdened by it? I really love what we can do at Renewal. I think Renewals uh, is, is a great time to really hit things uh, and engage policyholders. I think most policyholders don't know a lot about insurance, but one thing they do understand, is, especially if they've had insurance before, is that insurance, generally speaking, is a, is a term limit thing that's going to have an expiration and then we're going to renew and start with a new term. So they understand that things will change on a year or two year or three year cycle or whatever your, your renewal terms are. So I think, you know, what we can do as a carrier at this time is we can present them that scenario and say, hey, it's time for a policy checkup. Um, and, and you see some of the questions there, you know, have you made changes to your property? Did you add any of the following? Um, has your billing information changed? Is your mailing address still valid? Uh, all these things that simple, but yet they really help out. Uh, and that from a policyholder standpoint, it keeps them up to date. It's definitely better for them. You know, the, the ultimate goal is to make sure they have the most protection relative to what they have and what they need to, to really support them. Um, and I think this lets them know that, you know, their, their carrier and their agent is, is staying on top of them, you know, making sure that they're not just a number, but that, oh, yeah, they're checking up on me. Um, yep. You know what? I did add a shed this week that, or this last year. That's right. And I didn't tell you about it because we all know insureds never tell their insurance carriers about new stuff after they've done it. Um, yeah, from an agent standpoint, uh, definitely, again, helps them stay up to date with the policyholder, gives them really good PR. And I, I think it, it cuts out a lot of extra work later. Um, you know, yes, the insured didn't tell us that they put a shed in their property, that they constructed a pool or, or they got dogs or whatever. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, that information comes out at some point, uh, usually not in a great way, because usually it's claim involved or something like that. So if we can, you know, on these, these renewal times or even other intermittent times, if we can just do a policy checkup with our, with the insureds, um, agent can check in and it really helps to have that information update, make sure that they're most protected, uh, that their, their insurance is adequate for them and that we don't get a whole bunch of surprises on the back end because nobody likes surprises like that. And from the carrier standpoint, you know, it just keeps us in good shape again um, and, and keeps our data, keeps our data as current as possible, which is what we're looking for. We just want to have accurate data so that when our insureds uh, need something, we can definitely look at the data and know that we have reliable data. We can help them with that. And again, keep those surprises out. And I really think the you know, mailing addresses is probably one of the big ones that comes up on us a lot. I know for Pennsylvania, I'm sure a lot of you guys have dealt with this. Over the last number of years now, there's continues to be the, the tinkering with the 911 address changes. Um, so, you know, definitely that's the biggest challenge that I think a lot of carriers run into just because you want to make sure that if they're not digital, that you're getting proper mailing for them. You know, if they have the app, uh, you know, or policy holder access on the web, that's great because you can still get them their electronic documents. But for the people that don't do electronically, we want to make sure that they, um, you know, we can get a bill to them. We can get their updated deck sheet to them. We can get their auto ID cards to them. You know, very important. So, um, just checking in every now and then to, to get those simple information updated really helps. And then we get to claims. Um, I really think digital for claims is, is where we see a huge you know, potential here. Um, you know, with, 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 with an app, uh, you know, or portal access, we can give the claim, the, uh, the insured's the ability to, to really man help manage their claim and keep it up to date and moving quickly. Uh, because as a carrier, what we don't want to do is we, we don't like waiting on insureds for stuff. Just like insureds don't like waiting for us, we don't want to wait for them. We want to be very responsive to them. We want to say, yep, if, if you can get me this stuff, we'll turn this around real quick. Because we want to, you know, at the end of the day, we want to pay that claim and get the, uh, you know, get the insured made whole again uh, and support them. So, um, 
you know, biggest thing I see with that, that, that our people really enjoy is you know, that ability to upload photos directly. Um, classic example I always use is uh, if you have a little homeowner's policy and, it, you know, get a windstorm, tree blows down over the driveway, you know, person can't get up to park their car in their garage because a big tree down across it. Um, we can, you know, in this case, if, especially if the tree didn't hit the house at all, it just is covering the driveway, it just needs some, you know, little money to remove that tree. Um, as a carrier, you know, we probably don't need to send somebody out to investigate that. That's pretty much bang, bang on, on the checkbox there, but we want a proof of it. So we ask the insured and say, hey, can you take a photo and send to us? And I'm sure all you guys have heard the insured say, well, yeah, I can definitely take a photo. I, I know how to take a photo with my smartphone, but I don't know how to get it to you. And, uh, you know, there's a ton of ways to do that, but even like emailing uh, can be difficult because, you know, phones these days are taking huge pictures and email, you can only send so much size and spam filters are constantly changing. So it, it creates a challenge that people run into. Um, so if you have an app or, or some kind of digital access with a computer, but definitely with an app for the phone, um, you can upload it right to the app, hit send and the photo's there and it bypasses all those challenges that, that are out there that could interfere with getting that photo from point A to point B. And then we can look at the photo, say, yep, there's a tree down, your policy has coverage, let's trigger the, the payment on that and, and close it out and be done. And the policy holder is like, wow, that was easy. <laughs> you know, I just took a photo and then I got a message back, said, yep, good enough and we're done. Um, obviously that's a simple claim. You get into the more complicated claims, there's more going on there, but they can still upload photos and estimates. If their contractor gives an estimate, they can upload that. Um, and just that ability to check on the status of their claim. Um, if you, you know, whether it's auto or, or, or property related, um, you know, if you have a claim going on, you're as an insured, I think your, your goal is just to, everybody just wants to get it behind them. It's like, okay, this event happened. What do I gotta do to get past this and get it taken care of? Nobody likes to have things hanging over their heads. So it's nice for them to be able to just check on that and say, oh, yep, I see what's happening. My adjuster told me he's waiting on this. Yep, I see he has this scheduled. Okay, I see this is coming through. That It just gives them good peace of mind and, and uh, you know, confirmation that things are moving in a timely manner, um, which just helps with uh, you know, their, their comfort level and their trust. And it also helps so that if they're curious about something going, well, why hasn't that happened yet? And they look on it and check the status and the status says, you know, we're waiting for a photo from you or you, you waiting for you to sign this document. Oh, okay. You're waiting on me. So they're not going to pick up the phone and call us. They're just going to take care of it. Um, and then I think when you get into the loss control section, I really see a lot of options here. Um, being digital allow gives you a lot more granular control to target push notifications to people. Um, so, you know, thinking of some examples, uh, you know, see if you have a seasonal hunting cabin right now, it's hunting season in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, deer season is going on. Well, we, we get to middle next month, hunting season is going to end. We can, you know, look at the people on our, on our policies that have those seasonal hunting cabins. We can say, hey, uh, let's send them a push notification, remind them, hey, it's, uh, you know, it's 10 days till Christmas, hunting season's over, and, uh, you know, freezing weather is coming up. So did you make sure you shut the water off and drain the pipes so that you don't have any freezing issues? Um, if there's a, a hailstorm coming, you know, we, uh, don't always know fast about that, but you know, the weather, uh, the weather technology out there is getting better and better that now we can, you know, we can get some notification about that. So we can send a push notification to everybody and say, Hey, uh, all you auto policy holders, um, you know, hailstorm coming, uh, see if you can get your car parked under roof somewhere. Uh, definitely want that. Um, you know, I, I know that's used in other places for, you know, the, the weather reporting for like hurricanes and stuff is obviously well advanced given the nature of them. But, uh, even for us, if there's a hurricane coming up, we're not as worried about the winds as much probably by the time it gets here, but rain is always an issue. So, you know, we can send a push notification and say, Hey, uh, you know, there's another Greek hurricane coming up, Greek named hurricane coming up. And, uh, you know, they're calling for a foot of water. So did you, uh, clean your gutters out? Did you do this? I mean, I think a lot of possibilities are that we can target people specifically versus when you're printing paper, maybe you would just include a, a loss control newsletter every now and then that, maybe applied to some people, maybe didn't because you couldn't always sort it out as easily. But when it's digital, it's that direct communication to that specific insured instead of part of a bulk batch. So a lot of options there. Oops. So, um, you know, I think in summary, um, as Jess, you know, did a great job showing, you know, from an agent perspective, there's a lot of things we can do and, and not all of them are overly challenging. Just have to think about it. How can we modernize that approach to increase the throughput as you think about digital investments? And um, 
you know, as I think she mentioned, if we can just move that green bar over just a little bit, um, that's in everybody's, uh, you know, it's an advantage to everybody and that's in everybody's favor. If, if, you know, a little bit of time spent to, to go from traditional approach to a modern approach, if it makes a couple percentage points difference, um, that's definitely worth taking a look at. And then from a policyholder perspective, it's, it's really, you know, being digital in, in as many aspects as you can allows your policyholder to have that instant access to their policy to be able to really do transactions with it. Really benefits agents because um, on one hand, it can take a lot of the processing off of the agents because now you have that self-service where the policyholder can do it themselves. And then on the other one, it allows the agents to really hone in on, on more higher level things with them. And at the end of the day, you know, just trying to keep it simple and asking, what does the policyholder want? What do they expect? And what can we give them so that, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, they're like, wow, my insurance carrier and my agent really have it going on. I can do everything I need right from here. And that really improves their overall experience with, with the product. And we are to the questions. Jess, anything you wanted to add there to that? Oh, I think you muted. Sorry. Yep. So I didn't want to accidentally say any cough or anything in you. Um, I guess just as carriers want to invest in that straight through processing, they know speed drives writing more new business and getting agents through quicker can be a large lift, um, even bigger than rate decreases. But, the, but it is ongoing, it is complicated to get started, um, to manage and improve customer question sets, you, you know, agent question sets. So just using data and analytics along with underwriting is really a nice way to get started in that from the beginning. And then going into the policyholder services and, um, and creating that whole, whole view from beginning to end of digital is, is really a nice, um, it's a, it's a, it's a way that the carriers are moving. And so just, you know, that's kind of, that's it. I just wanted to share that. All right. Well, I don't see any questions. So I will, uh, I guess we'll leave it at that. I appreciate uh, both of you spending the time on this topic. It's, it's something that uh, certainly uh, with, my in my role in marketing and dealing with our agents it's an ongoing dialogue on a daily basis uh, these types of conversations about digital and how to make things easier and more efficient and quicker so you gave us a lot uh, of good information and i appreciate uh, your time today so with that um, we're going to actually end ahead of schedule which is a good a good thing i believe uh, let me just take a second here to thank everyone who registered and participated in the uh, conference today. We will be sending you an email with a survey link and we would really appreciate your feedback on what we might be want to cover next year, what we did well this year with our virtual sessions, what we might do differently next year. Um, we will also make available all these presentations on the PANIC website. That, that link will be included with the survey. So we would ask you to uh, feel free to take those that information along and reach out to their speakers as you feel needed. Again, I'd like to thank our sponsors who make this all possible and who do so much to support PAMIC in their efforts uh, for the mutual uh, insurance companies in the state of Pennsylvania. Lastly, I wanna thank our underwriting committee members for their hard work in putting this together. And most importantly, the PAMIC staff, Britt and Andrea who helped put this together. So with that, I, I thank you for your attendance today. And we look forward to seeing you in person next year. Um, so have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you.